Then, yeah, just wear the beanie. That's it. That's pretty solid. I feel good about that. That's a good way to start this. Get the attitude up high, you know. Good trade two J's if you could become Wolverine. Where are you getting all this information? I definitely heard some some rumors about it. Are you still going? For, I, I can't get goosebumps thinking about it because it's like you can hear them get the car. I was going to qualify and I was going to drive it out the racetrack. Just threw the hood over the ditch and longest employee of Knox. You did some digging there, huh? I'm super pumped to meet as many people as I possibly can this year, especially those that are smart enough to use FD Podcast at checkout, save themselves a couple of dollars on their FD tickets. Those are the people I really want to meet, mostly because I get a ton of high fives, a bunch of thank yous. A couple of people tried to give me some money for it, but uh, nope, didn't take it. But yeah, if you want to be one of those lucky few people to save some money, use FD Podcast at checkout, save a couple bucks, see you at the event. What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to The Outer Zone, the official podcast of Formula Drift. Uh, as always, my name is Jacob Gettens, and today we have probably the most requested episode so far, Forrest Wang. So, <laughs> What's dude, up, guys? What's up, man? Um, dude, yeah, seriously, like of, of everybody in the roster, it's like you and maybe one or two other drivers where like I'd release an episode and people would just DM me and be like, cool, like that's great, but like when's Forrest coming on? So, <laughs> wow. Yeah, yeah, dude. I mean, it's got to it's gotta feel pretty good to be a, a fan favorite like i don't know if yeah, that's, that's like awesome. something that's is that something that's like ever hit you or anything like just knowing that that you know you're I, I, or the people like you like i don't i don't know what that's like really <laughs> i guess i never really think about it my girl like tells me just like you know you the fans want to see you drive because like honestly i still i don't even know if i'm driving this year oh shit okay and uh <laughs> yeah <laughs> i know i'm like supposed to be all like finalized and everything ready to go but you know life happens so yeah. here we are yeah. and uh don't really have a program together yet but maybe we'll pull something together i feel like i don't know i i, I mean you and i don't know each other super well but like i just feel like your relaxed mentality of kind of like well if it is it is like you know if it comes together then cool like it was meant to be and this is what we're going to do and if it doesn't then i'll find something else to do yeah exactly i can't stress too much on drifting like honestly there's a lot going on in my life and you know the other things that are important to me too yeah. and uh i don't want to stress myself all out you know trying to make it happen if it's not meant to happen yeah i i feel like you've always just kind of been like almost like the king of fun where it's like i'm here to enjoy myself and that's that's what i'm here to do like you put on a show drive your way and and yeah if they, if you're not doing that then then why be doing it right Exactly. Yeah. I mean, we all started drifting because it was fun. You know, we did it because we love doing it. And uh, if you're not having fun, then like you said, why are you, why are you doing it? Yeah. I, I think it's, it's gotta be so tough to like manage it both as like a job at like the highest level and then still try and get enjoyment out of it. I mean, I know you, you, I, I'd be curious at how, like on the scale of like all FD drivers, when it comes to like party drifting, like how many days out you get versus everybody else. Cause like, I feel like you're out basically every moment that you can a lot but not as much as rome i'd say rome's definitely yeah he's everywhere a dude's a machine i don't understand how he does and he's doing most of it in his pro car too which is wild to me yeah 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 it's definitely he's he's always out at events and i love going to events where rome's at too because you know you know you got to like another high level driver to drive with and jam with and that's the best you know driving with high level drivers you can be so much more comfortable than driving with uh people that you haven't driven with or you don't trust as much and you know yeah. when you're driving with people that you trust and that are high level and you can you know know that you can go in it's just a lot better that way yeah i i watching you like drive at laguna like that like i'd see you like you know out on track and then you kind you guys would like go up the hill and you'd be behind like another pro driver i'm like oh shit this is going to be epic and then same thing like you can you can just push harder right i think there's just it's like a trust fall like you know you're gonna yes. get caught and you know they they know what to do in case of a a bad situation. So, yeah. Yeah. Talking about Laguna, man. Oh, that's so awesome. Dude. How, was that like, was that one of those tracks that you've always wanted to drive or was it just one of those, like when you realize you were driving, you're like, Oh shit, this is a big deal. It was, uh, you know, you never really think about drifting that track because it just wasn't done. People weren't drifting that track. And when it popped up, I was like, no way. Like grid life's going to do Laguna. Like, I got to go. And yeah, it just worked out. And like, I had no idea how much of a elevation change that was going to be. Like, it's a massive drop and uh, it's definitely awesome, awesome driving on that track. 
Yeah, something's so weird about that. Like, like, cause the car loads up so heavy coming over that crest, right? Like you can hear it and feel it. And then as soon as you come over that ridge, like you're depending on the line, but like you're transitioning coming over it and just like, yeah, you almost float for a second before the car settles again. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Those are a couple of runs I swear I saw front tires coming off the ground. I know if you get lost in the smoke in a transition and you cut it too early on the transition, I mean, you could end up coming all four tires off the ground. I think JTP said he debeated two tires behind me <laughs> because he like transitioned through the smoke and ended up like taking the the drop and blew out both his rear tires when he landed. <laughs> I see funny. That dude parties so hard. Like when it comes to like the drifting side of things, like I don't know. You I I still put like you guys down as like the the style, like within FD, like like the highest style drivers, which is uh I mean, it's kind of cool too because you guys both do it in such different ways, right? Like your driving style in general is much more floaty and and kind of fun. Mm. I mean, I know it's obviously changed over the years, whereas like his is a lot of style, but because it's like blatantly aggressive. Like it's almost angry driving. Like you could almost yeah. picture him like screaming behind the wheel, even though he's probably not. Whereas yours, <laughs> like it just, it seems almost dreamy, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. I hear you. Yeah. Is that like, did you ever, did you, do you make like the conscientious choice to drive that way? Or is that just like, that's how you started. That's how you've always run and anything else is the decision. Yeah. I think that's just always how I have controlled the car. And, um, it's just, I don't know how to describe it. It's just fluid. You know, you just try not to make too many corrections. You set the angle and make the car run that angle. You mm-hmm. know, whatever you can do with the rear tires to keep that car in that angle is kind of like how I drive, I guess, to where you don't see a lot of like corrections out of the steering wheel or a lot of, you know, wavering in and out of drift. So to me, like that's what feels right. Mm-hmm. And if you're fighting it, if you're trying to steer the car to make it drift, then it doesn't feel right. You know, you should be steering with the rear tires, okay. whether it's throttling or clutch kicking or e-braking or something to keep the car in that same angle without wavering or without adjustments. Then to me, that's just what feels right. And I guess that's always stuck in my head and I just try to do what feels right. I guess like really interesting. Cause I think a lot of people who are like maybe like middle of the road into drifting, like don't realize that to do a properly or actually steering with the throttle and not, the inputs in the the steering wheel. Like mm-hmm. it seems so counterintuitive. And then once you learn or feel what that feels like, it's like, oh, this is so much easier. So yeah. 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 Is there is you use there- the steering to initiate, you flick the car, you get the car in an angle, but then once you get in an angle, you kind of try to not steer it too much. If you're doing a lot of steering corrections, then it's going to be noticeable and visible in the drift and the way the car wavers, or even if the car doesn't waver, but you see the front wheels give an input, it just doesn't look as good as the set into counter steer and not, not shifting. Mm -hmm. I think it's just way more noticeable too. Like you can, you can, because the the front's not really like bathed in smoke, right? Like you can see Mm -hmm. everything that's going on there. Whereas like the rears, you can kind of get away with a little bit more. I mean, not, not as easy now with the, the tire print and the, and the spoke tape and stuff like that. But like, right. Realistically, you can, you can do that a bit more, especially if there's like a loud car that you're driving with. Right. Cause like, they, they're not going to catch every single throttle input. If, you know, if you're tandeming behind Chelsea, there's no way they're hearing you. I mean, I, I can tell you, you're not hearing your engine over his. Like right, it's just, right. there is not even a 2J sound in the air when, when those Mustangs <laughs> yeah. are going around. Uh, I mean, so I like, have you ever on the, like on the 2J now, have you ever thought about driving any, like competing or driving at a high level with anything but a 2J? Oh, definitely. Yeah. Definitely. I mean, I wouldn't mind driving a different engine platform. It's just, that's what I'm invested in. And and that's what I have to where it just makes the most sense. I mean, I drove Matt Fields car at Fuel Fest and that was definitely an experience. So it wouldn't, I mean, it wouldn't be a bad thing. Like for me as a driver, like driving a healthy LS, just it's always there for you. You know, as to where I feel like the 2J, it takes a bit more work, you know, being in the right gear, having the right, you know, gear in in the rear end having everything kind of at the right rpm and the right you know power band is very important as to where like i feel like with the ls you can kind of get you know it's a little bit <laughs> less <laughs> important it's still important yeah. obviously all these all these guys are getting the gearing right but like i feel like it's easier to 
I don't know. It's like a cushion just around like, it, right? Like you it's have- a totally different, it's a totally different style though. Yeah. Like totally different. Like, cause with the Jay-Z, you're floored, you know, as for the LS, like you can't really like floor it all the time. Like mm-hmm. they're so powerful unless you gear it to where you're just banging red line the whole way. But like even leaving the line, like if you floor it, you just blow the tires off of it. Like I can floor my car leaving the line and it's not going to just gross the tires. Yeah. You can like make it out of the chicane before it really lights up. Whereas like the LSs or, or any of the V8s, like if you stood on it right away, you're just, you're going to smoke everything out at that time. Hmm. Yeah. I, I mean, I could definitely see it being more forgiving. Like, I don't know. I'll never take anything away from anybody driving any engine, but like, it definitely seems easier. <laughs> like, just yeah, from the outside, I mean, all the driving's badass. Like every every yeah. driver in FD, they're killing it, and it doesn't matter what power plant you have. It's just a two totally different styles of driving. Like the the V8, I feel like you gotta have a lot of throttle control. Which I mean, obviously, you gotta have a lot of throttle control in Jay Z too, but you gotta really like pick when to use it. It's almost like a clutch kick. If you floor it, it just can blow the tires off mm-hmm. at any any time you want. I feel like the, the LS the, is like the, more modulation kind of near the bottom end of things. Whereas, you know, with, with the 2J, it's like you have to be just so aware of boost and, and where you're at at all times that like, it's just, yeah, it's just very different. Like you just, yeah. you just can't control it the exact same way. Like how, how, I don't know what the fans would do if I drove a LS though, right? Well, that's like, that's what I've always wondered. Like I asked this, like with Kyle Mohan and uh, even with like Dean Carney, like guys who are kind of locked into a, to a system is like, that's gotta be such a, a, I mean, to put it bluntly, like a mind fuck to be like, Hey, I could drive this thing and do something different or, you know, potentially better or worse or whatever. But like, if I do that, is it still me driving? Right. Like, I, I feel like you're one of those guys where, you know, your style is phenomenal. And then the, even the way that drifting is just gone or FD has gone in particular, like, you have to decide, do I want to service the fans and, and myself or do I want to win, right? Like those are, those don't always go mutually exclusive to each other. That's, that's the hard part. You're right. People, people just expect me in a Jay-Z. They expect that style of uh, the sound and yeah. the style of driving that it comes with. They just expect that. But, you know, if I ever switch, say, chassis, like I might have to switch power plants. I mean, never know. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, dude, I like personally... I just want to see you guys drive at the highest level possible, but also I don't ever want someone to do something that's so out of character. It doesn't make sense. Right. Like that's, that's the hard part. Would I love to see, you know, a driver like Kyle Mohan in particular, like do like be significantly more competitive in a different chassis with a different power power plant. Yeah. Cause I've seen that dude drive in a non Mazda, non rotary. Like there's, there is footage out there and like, you know, the guy can drive significantly better than, Maybe what he shows in, in FD, but also like marketing wise, business wise, does it make sense to do that? Right. His whole life is rotaries. So like, right. Right. Big ass to be like, yo, don't drive that anymore. Right. Yeah. People always ask me like, would you switch chassis? And I'm like, yeah, I would. If the opportunity presented itself, of course I'd switch into something. If there was some corporate sponsor that was like, Hey, we want you to drive this car and there was money behind it. Like, yeah. I mean, I couldn't really like turn that down, but same thing with like the Jay Z's. Like, this is what I have, and this is what I'm invested in, and this is what just works for me with my small budget and small team. And you know, we're just making it work with what we have. Yeah. Do you do you have like just a warehouse full of Jay Z's like sitting now at this point? Are you just like hoarding them like Rad Dan? <laughs> no, no. I, I have a few though. Definitely. I mean, I got like I think four cars that run that have Jay Z's in them. So those four, and then I have a few sitting around. So yeah, there's always a few in rotation. The guys in Vegas that just racing, you know, we, it's like a revolving door. We're like, we got one in the car fresh and then they're like fixing another one, getting it ready to where we have a good spare on backup and kind of keep that, keep that going. Is there, is there something that like, I don't know what, like them doing it or something you're requesting in those engines. Cause they definitely, your Jay-Z sound different. And I don't know if it's an exhaust thing or a manifold or like a particular turbo, but like it, it is distinctive. I feel like I could listen to five Jay-Z's go off and be able to pick yours out of, out of that, that crowd. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't think it's anything to do with my exhaust or the turbo or anything. I think it's the tune. I think it's all in the tune. I mean, Kyle LeBlanc, he tunes the car and he always has. So I, I kind of think that it has to do with the tune more than any of the parts. Cause a lot of the parts are very similar, you know, guys are running similar, you know, manifold similar turbos i mean jay-z engine it's they're pretty much you know we're all running the same parts so yeah i think it has to do more with the tune 
There's only, I mean, there's, there's lots of parts for them, but I, I know what you're saying like, there's only so much. They're you can all do similar. Yeah. 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 There's right. a system that works pretty well in it. So why not? Mm. Might as well stick with that. Right. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. I, I would, dude, I'd love to just see, I mean, I kind of wish I was at fuel fest to see what you would have done in, in Matt Field's car. Like how, how long did it take before you got a handle of it? So I really didn't get like a full handle of it. I only got one pair of tires, which was three laps, three laps on a little peanut track. So we, I had talked to Matt at uh, Laguna, Laguna Seca. We were partying after the the T Pain concert and everything. And like, I was sitting in his car. He's like, "That feel good." I'm like, "Yeah, this feels really good, actually." He's like, "Well, let me know when you want to drive it." I'm like, uh, "What events are we both going to be at next?" And he's like, "Fuel Fest." And I was like, "Okay, Fuel Fest." So I'll drive it at Fuel Fest. And uh, oh, okay, just got a, a quick spin. He actually had got food poisoning. Yeah, so he came late late that day and. Uh, I like text him. I'm like, man, what's up? He's like, oh, I got food poison. I'm like, oh shit. Like, can I still uh, whip the vet? And he's like, yeah, yeah, just go over there. Just, it's ready to go. Just jump in. Just take it. I'm like, uh, I felt kind of weird. I was like, uh, well, I'll just like at least wait for Chow and, and these Alec to be there because I'm not going to like jump in your car with like nobody knowing I'm taking it. So yeah, they came over and like, okay, time to clock in your other. Your other job. I'm like, cool, let's do it. I was stoked. That was definitely uh, an experience. First time driving a vet, a drift vet. Yeah. And um, first time driving an LS setup like that. I've driven a couple other LSs, but not that Vortec uh, supercharged setup. So it was, it was definitely, it was a lot of fun. I'd say on my third lap, I started to like understand what I needed to do. And then the tires were gone. (laughs) Another set of tires would have been awesome, but they definitely drive a lot different than an S chassis. Like an S chassis will, transition off throttle it'll float on you as to where the vet like if you let off throttle the thing wants to go straight Mm. it needs to throttle through transition to get going the next direction which is nice because then you're on throttle more it just seems like it wants to be on throttle a lot more that's really interesting because like that that makes me think of uh just irwindale like the inner clip right because like that's such a That whole track, like everybody kind of has to run it generally the same way but that inner clip is like really where drivers rise or shine like that's kind of where it's made mm-hmm. right if you do everything else perfectly like that inner clip is the differentiator but right i've never thought of it like that where the s chassis can float that and then corvettes or other chassis may have to drive through that so like mm-hmm. you know if you're chasing a, a corvette in that you kind of have to like float for a second and then get back on power push right harder away. yeah you got to get back on throttle quicker and that's yeah. what i noticed driving with a lot of a lot of these drivers because everybody's so fast and like I tend to like things to like float out and be like super smooth and fluid, but that doesn't actually work following a lot of these drivers that are just gripped up and hooked up and on the move to where I'll catch myself doing things that I wouldn't normally do in a lead run when I'm following somebody. So like Uh, you said, just pushing yourself out of your comfort zone, pushing yourself a little bit past that point of what, you know, you're comfortable doing. And hmm. uh, yeah, I definitely remember myself a few battles at Irwindale, you know, going against different drivers and having a, stay on the throttle longer, having to, you know, just push a little bit harder. Yeah. Which is good. That's why we're out here driving with some of the best drivers in the world. You know, it definitely pushes you. Is it like, from your perspective, is there that much of a difference between each driver and each car and that kind of stuff? Like, I think for a lot of people, they they look at it like, oh, you just have to like fill the zones and get around the track and and that's it. Whereas, you know, for me, I, I feel like I, if if I didn't know what the car was, I could probably still pick out who the driver is just based on how they get around the track. But like from your perspective in chasing, like how different, how different is it between maybe like James Dean and Chelsea or something, same chassis, just two very different drivers. The Mustangs to me are like some of the hardest to follow just because how much like motion there is and like the weight transfer and everything, like those things move so much. And sometimes, you know, like they like jump on it hard and then that like, it just jacks and like the front tires picking up in there. And especially with Chelsea, like guy throws huge angle. And sometimes that's like, it's hard. And I, it's funny. I laugh because like I was the one like always throwing a ton of angle and yeah, it's, it's harder to chase. Like yeah. when you're following Chelsea, sometimes you're like, Oh, what's going on? You know? Cause the car it's picking up a front tire and he's like 90 degrees and I get it. It's, it's hard to follow, but I mean, it, it's drifting, right? It's, it's all part of the game. Yeah. Well, it's like, that's basically how Adam won New Jersey was like his entry in New Jersey was, was some of the craziest drive I've ever seen, like period. And just, 
I mean, other than really Simon, no one could touch him. Like no one knew what to do. And even Simon like was struggling to figure out how the hell you handle that initiation. Like, I feel like, I feel like you might be the only other person that'd be like, oh shit, I see what you're doing. Like, hang on, let me, he, let me float out way right. And I'm going to swing in right behind you. He was definitely on one at that event. I mean, he, he phased like some of the best. Yeah. Like, I mean, I saw James Dean go off. Like it just, it was insane, insane to watch him throw it on at that level. Like, you know, he can do it, but it was more of like that inconsistent. And then that event, he just threw down run after run after run. And it was like textbook every time he was doing the same thing to where you couldn't knock him for it because like he had it down. It just was Mm -hmm. doing that same initiation every time. And it was like, how do you follow that? It's really hard because it's at the limit. Like Mm -hmm. there's not any more track left. There's not any more angle that you could have thrown. It was just, everything was there. And it was like, it just worked. Well, it's it's fast. Like he was, he was like full throttle right out of the gate. So like, I don't know how he, I still, I could go back and watch him. Like, I don't know how you (laughs) caught that car in time. Like it makes no yeah. sense how that car didn't just green, you know, through the grass. It doesn't make any sense to me. But man, no, it's it's those moments that are like that really like what make the sport what it is, right? Like <clears throat> those are the things we think about and what we talk about are like these crazy, crazy scenarios, crazy initiations, crazy whatever. So for me, like I want to see the the sport go that way. Like however it is, like I just want every battle to be one that we have to talk about, right? Like we have to break it down. So I just, I'm, I'm not sure how we get there. Like, I don't know. I, I would love to get your, your thoughts on that. Like just in general, like how do we make this sport so much cooler, I guess? Well, I'm, I'm interested in uh, 2025. I guess they're talking about doing some type of tire limitation Mm -hmm. to where I think that that's going to help the sport go not like back, but just the driving is going to get so good and so consistent because you're going to take out some of that intense, insane grip that everyone has right now because it's so gripped up and the cars are so fast and it's badass. Like it's harder to drive a car that's super gripped up than a car that's looser, but then it's also not as consistent. Mm -hmm. You can't do the same run 99 times out of a hundred because the car is so gripped up. Sometimes it just takes you for a ride and you're like, wow, like here we're going. Let's, like see where it goes but going back to a little bit smaller tire or a higher tread wear tire something like that could really make like level it a bit level the playing field a little bit to where i think the tandems are going to get better the driving is going to get more consistent and then you're just going to see some insane battles like super close tandems like you know just because the cars will be a little bit more matched at that point i think Mm -hmm. Because right now there's a big a big gap between tires. You know, you got some 285s and you got some 315s. Yeah. You know, it's if they limited it at 275 or 285 or something like that, like it, I feel like it would kind of even things up a bit. I, I had someone like I I just think this is like one of the biggest debates in FD right now. That's why I like I kind of bring it up with all the drivers, like the tire debate. Cause like I want to know. I just mm-hmm. everyone's got such a different perspective on it. But someone not that long ago said to me that like Nobody will notice five miles an hour difference, but everyone will notice a foot of proximity difference. Like that, that you will see. You will 100% notice if they're a foot closer the entire run. No one's going to know if they're five miles an hour faster. And I was like, right. that's an interesting take on it. Like, yeah, if you slowed it down five miles an hour, but then the driving got closer and got more consistent, got more fluid, closer to the walls, whatever the case, you know, I just feel like it's going to bring some really good drifting. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Is there, how do, like, how do we get style back? Like, I, th- everybody has a style for sure, but like, how, there's how still do we get style. It's, yeah. It's drifting. There's style. Like, I mean, look, Chelsea won the championship and he's still throwing huge angle. I mean, it's just a different style. It's not this like floaty, smooth style that it used to be. It's just, it's FD style now. Mm. It's, it's its own style. You know, it's, totally respect all different kinds of driving and all different kinds of drifting. It's just its own style. It's progressed to like a really, really fast ballsy type of driving. And it's just, it's hard to do all the time. And that's why you got some of these drivers coming up and down and, you know, not as consistent because some, it just might not be as easy to drive. It's a little more hit or miss. Yeah. We're, we're, if we're, you, we're on the razor's edge, like the whole time. Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. There's no, there's not a lot of room for error, not a, little, a lot of room for correction. You're just, like you said, razor's edge. You're balls to the wall, and this has to work. And if it doesn't work, 
I might crash or I might straighten up. Mm. You don't know. I my only fear with like getting tandem better is like, how are we gonna judge it when it gets that close? Like that's my biggest concern with it is like lots of one more times. Bro, I can only until somebody <laughs> messes up. Because some people, I mean, you will mess up eventually. Yeah. Three, one more time. Somebody's going to mess up. But yeah, I mean, you can't do one more times for every battle. But that's kind of what it's going to come down to because the driving is going to get so consistent that it's really going to take somebody messing up to get eliminated. Because like you said, the tandems are going to be so close and so good that it's, but I mean, that's what we're wanting, right? Yeah. Really good tandems. Because you don't want somebody throwing a runaway and okay, he wins. And it's just the easy, okay, we know who won. But like right. having really close battles with really good, consistent drivers, like who's going to win? You don't really, you can't call it because you're like, everybody's been driving so good. How do we, how do we pick a winner on this one? <laughs> this show's going to be so long. Like it's going to, if we get to that point, I mean, it's going to be five, six hour long event, which I mean, for some people, I think that's great. Like, I mean, for the fans and shit like that, like you're getting, you're getting your money's worth for sure. I just think it'll exactly. be, it'll be tough. <laughs> Yeah, no, it will. It'll be tough. Yeah, I, I, dude, I'm, I'm, I'm down. I want to. I don't know. I just, I don't even know really what I want anymore. I just want the show to be good. Like, I want more people to talk about the sport. At the end of the day, right? Like, I want, I want to like wear an FD sweater around, and everybody more or less be aware of what that is. In the same way that like my dad can wear a NASCAR jacket around, mm -hmm. and everybody is aware of what it is. I mean, I know the driver that that jacket is from, but they're like, oh, that's NASCAR, right? Like, right. you know, right now, like, I, I mean, unless there's, there's like, I, I went to hockey the other night, I had an FD sweater on. I'll bet you almost anybody in that dressing room had no idea what, what it was. There might've been a couple guys, but like, that's, that's the question is like, how do we get the sport to that size? And then the right. question is like, do we want the sport that big? Right. That's, that's the other part. I think it, I think it just depends on who you talk to. Like, Right. I don't know. Do you, do you feel like protective of this sport? Like, like where it's like, this is, this is our little niche culture thing. Or are you kind of on the, like, no, this, this let's, let's blow this shit up. Let's go as big as we possibly can. Yeah. I'd say blow it up, you know, pass it on to whoever will take interest in it. I love taking people for ride alongs. I love putting on a show, giving people something to like cheer about, you know, that's like why we're doing it. Yeah. Just, get as many people excited about the sport as we can. I mean, why not? Right. Like, yeah. Yeah. It's good for all of us. Yeah. It's one of those, like if you take someone for a ride along, you know, they're hooked. Like I'm sure, you know, you've taken hundreds of people out. Like I, I, I'd love to know what the, the rate is of like still fans. Like, if you took a hundred people out, like how many people are watching FD every, you know, every event or going to events and stuff still, it's gotta be in the high yeah, like probably, 90%. Yeah. Probably most mm -hmm. of them. Yeah. I'd say most of them for sure. Yeah. I, I have people message me all the time. Like tell me that like I inspired them to get into drifting and they went for a ride along, or even they just saw me drift at a certain event that maybe I stood out at and they're like, I saw you drive that event and you know, you inspired me to drift and now I'm building my car and I'm like, hell yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, it's got to be. I mean, dude, one of my favorite moments of all time was you and Rome at the line in uh, in Long Beach, right? And he like looks over and he's yelling and he's like, "Dude, like I I grew up watching you. Like you're the reason I'm into this." And I think I think your response oh. is like, "All right, let's like let's put on a show." And I was like, "Oh, dude, like goosebumps immediately." Yeah, like that's yeah. that to me is exactly what we should be aiming for, right? Yeah, you don't see that in many other type of motorsports, right? Like, yeah, that camaraderie at the line where like it's either me or him, but yet we're just so stoked to like be battling each other on that circuit in front of all those people. Are like, let's go put on a show. Yeah, I think let's do it. I think that's such a like maybe a difference. Like everybody wants to win, right? But I think the sport is so fan based and like so fan excitement based that like that almost takes the precedent over winning. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I, we see it all the time. Like we see guys, I mean, driving chassis that aren't as competitive because they're fan favorites. I, I mean, you can point to, I don't know how many of them where it's just like, no, I know people get excited about this. This is why I keep doing it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. so uh, can you explain to me why a very small Honda fit is the best pit vehicle that, that you can have? <laughs> um, It's almost like a K truck size, but yet you can fit four, Five, seven full size adults in it. Yeah. Seven, <laughs> and uh, drive it on the freeway. You know, it has AC and heat, and uh, 
I don't know. I just, it was a hand me down for my mom and I just hung on to it and it, it's light, it's small, gets great fuel economy. And, uh, yeah, we just kind of towed it around. <laughs> Dude, seeing a bunch of people cram into that thing and like, and it's already like, it's already pretty low. Like, Oh my God. I don't know how you haven't been replacing oil pans in that thing. Like after every event, cause like the thing is fairly low with, you know, a couple dudes in it. It's, it's pretty much scraping. It's hilarious. Yeah, it is. But that, that car will fit a lot of stuff inside of it too. I mean, I think we've put like 12 tires in there, really? 18 inch tires. <laughs> yeah. <sighs> it, it's got a lot of cubic feet on the inside, you know, seats fold down and you just can put a lot of stuff in there. It fits. It it's fits. Fit. Yeah. They branded it. Well, <laughs> they did it. They did a great job with it. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Uh, I, I remember seeing it like in the pits one day and I was like, huh, oh, okay. Like maybe I was like, is it a rental? Like, what is this? And then seeing it getting like loaded up in the rig, I was like, oh shit. Like <laughs> he just tows it with them. It's a good idea. It's better than, Yeah. Like you said, it's like a K truck. It's great can, on the road. Yeah. It's great on the road because if you like pull over somewhere and you got to go run some errands, it's nice to not have to like get the semi and go somewhere. You know, you just unload the fit real quick, go cruise over to the store, or go wherever you need to go. <laughs> it's one year we were going to Montreal back in like 2016 or something, and uh, we had a nasty trailer breakdown, and the hub actually left the chat and. Uh, the whole wheel tire hub gone. And we're like, oh crap, what do we do? So we unloaded the fit and crew chief Garrett at the time, he drove it four hours away to like Indiana, a state away to get to a trailer shop that had parts and then came back the next morning and we like fixed the trailer and made our way to where I was like, if we didn't have that, we would have had to call some kind of like service. It would have costed us 10 times as much, you know, and it worked, you know, having the fit was super convenient. Hmm. I, I think we may see like a whole shift in the whole like pit vehicle culture now because of this, like the K truck thing is definitely cool. Like, like Hooman's van and stuff like that is, I mean, it's, it's sick. Don't I love K trucks. Yeah. I love the K trucks, but they're not as like, you can't use them. You can't like, be cruising on the freeway at 80 in them. I yeah. mean, maybe you can. I don't know. I don't, I don't think I'd want to go 80 in a K truck, but <laughs> they knuckle. look super cool. Yeah. They look super cool. Like, I, I love how they look, but the, you know, the Honda, it's like, it just goes everywhere. The practicality outside of the pits is where it's lacking, right? Yeah. Like, within yeah. the paddock, it's, it's phenomenal. Like, they're tiny. You can get through the crowds and stuff, but like, the moment you have to leave the paddock, yeah, it's, it's definitely sketchy to, to bring that thing up to, I mean, I bet you even 40 miles an hour, that thing gets real sketchy. Yeah, they can't, they can't be too good for going freeway, highway speeds and stuff, but the very, like you said, convenient for getting through crowds, parking them. They've been uh, real popular in Hawaii. Like every time I go back to Hawaii, there's like so many more K trucks and like on the countryside of Hawaii where I'm from, it's like you go to like a restaurant or you go to like someplace and it's like, there's not parking to where these things are tiny. They fit anywhere, you know? And it's like, you don't have to drive fast because it's the country. Everybody's like the speed limit is 35 miles an hour to where it's perfect. You just drive along the country and you got your little K truck fits anywhere. Yeah. You just make your own parking. Right. <clears throat> yeah. 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 Somebody doesn't like it. They can like pick it up bed. and move it. <laughs> <laughs> how, how often are you going back? Like how often do you, do you visit Hawaii now? Uh, I usually go once a year. Okay. Yeah. But we just went back uh, in December for a friend's uh, wedding. And, uh, so that would be the second time in a year that I gone last year, but usually it's once a year. Yeah, like a like a week or two weeks or how much? Like, like a month at least. <laughs> <laughs> That's why it's it's tough. It's tough like running the FD circuit, and then like I'm like, okay, well, now I can't stay as long. You know, we used to kind of like work around it, just go for a couple weeks or something. This last season, I uh, missed Jersey and uh, St. Louis because one budget, like I didn't really have the money to make it all work or it just didn't make sense for me to try to make it work. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, it just, we went to Hawaii, hung out with the family. Nice. Yeah. That's that, you know, that balance of, of life and drifting has got to be the hardest part of this whole thing, right? Like you've been in this game for a bit. Like, I don't think people realize like you've been around, you look like you're 20 years old still, which I'm still trying to figure out how that works. But yeah, you've, you've been doing this for what? Close to 20 years now? Well, drifting, yeah, close to 20 years. FD, probably like 10. Yeah. I, I was in a in and out of a lot of subpar series before I got an FD. <laughs> we won't even say names, but yeah, it's just it's it, you know, it didn't work out, you know. But 
FD, yeah, I've been in it for a while. And like you said, it's very hard to balance everything, home, family, relationship, drifting, while you're trying to run your own program at the same time. Uh, hmm. I wish I could just be like a driver for a team and uh, just show up and drive. That would be like the dream right there. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, we see guys progress more when that happens, right? Like it, Chelsea's a good example of that. I mean, Simon's a great example of that. I mean, we're starting to really see it now with Turk too, with Papadakis, like mm-hmm. Freddie, obviously, like, I think, I think it would be, I think it'd be great, but like the trade-off is not running your own program or are you just kind of like <clears throat> running your own program is just so much work, right? That it's like, it I is. just need a break. It's so much work. <laughs> it's so much work, but then it's like, you get to control what you want to do with the program, mm. which is nice to have that freedom. But then I don't, I don't think it's worth the amount of work that goes into it. It is, it's very exhausting to say the least. What's the, what's the hardest part for you of like running a program? Like what's the part where it's like, you have to do it and you're like, this is the last thing I want to be doing right now. <laughs> um, I mean, all of it's kind of, it's all work, but I'm, I'm good, like hands on. I'm good at like building the cars, working on the cars. I mean, I load the rig, I drive the rig. I'm like really terrible when it comes to like relations, you know, like sponsors and obligations and stuff like that. Like it's, I need like a manager that can like help me manage all that. And like right now it's like my girlfriend, like she helps do that kind of stuff, but obviously she's got her stuff going on too, to where it's like, it's not her main priority to like help me run my program. It's like, she helps when she can. Yeah. But uh, like she was here helping me try to set up this computer because I'm pretty useless when it comes to this stuff. (laughs) We got you, man. It's all good. I, I still very much think I just need to start recording the moment I get online because the setup part of these shows is probably the funniest part of the whole thing. Oh yeah. 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 Can you hear me? Yeah. Can you hear me? <laughs> I, I can't hear you. Yeah, yeah. Let me call you really quick. Like, oh, let's just jump on. Okay. Press the dial in the back. Like I think part of me is like, I should probably send like very specific instructions about everything. And then part of me is also like, it's kind of a fun bonding experience. We get to work on a little project together. You know, you feel accomplished when it's all done. I don't know. <laughs> Should probably help you guys a little bit more. <laughs> oh, so what? what's the, like, you know, you becoming a dad is like, as as a dad myself, like that's, our, I would say the the most life-changing part of of my life. Like, what's that, what's that been like for you? Like, is that, I uh, super fulfilling like is the stress is there more pressure now like how how now that it's settled in like how are you feeling about it yeah like like you said i mean it's it's super fulfilling it's like the best feeling the most amazing thing you can do you know like having that that's part of you you've created and uh it's your job to like show them the world and you know guide them into this it's it's crazy it's Super challenging at the same time. Like she's three and a half right now and pain in the butt, like <laughs> <laughs> pain in the butt. But you know, it's, it's amazing at the same time. It's like, uh, you know, some days are great and some days you're like, why did I do this? Mm, but yeah, yeah, it's definitely, it's definitely awesome. You know, I, for, for my general opinion, girls are generally more difficult in like uh, until like obviously it gets complicated as they get a little bit older whereas boys are like super easy in the beginning but like my 10 year old right now he was great and now it's just like dude's dude's got an attitude learn how to talk back like you know it's it's a whole other set of worms i haven't dealt with yet and i'm like this is not what i was expecting so yeah kids they just chuck it off as kids you know yeah. they're kids I, mine's three and a half and she's already talking back i'm like oh my gosh what did i what, what have i done yeah <laughs> like you want them to be their own person but you're like can you just like do that but not the whole attitude part like it's cool if you have an attitude like that's good it's going to serve you well for a while but like just not to me other people yeah. not a problem like <laughs> right right Come on, listen to your parents. Yeah. Like we're we're the ones that allow you to be here and like get you all the things that you need in life and feed you. And yeah, yeah you still give us attitude. Like you gotta you gotta take care of your parents. It's, but that's it's, something I guess you don't figure out until you're like grown and you're like, wow, I was a little shit. I should have should have been better when I was a kid. Yeah. Dude, the the conversations I've had with my parents now, like I've apologized to them. I'm like, I am it's, so sorry for what I put you through. <laughs> I, I think I've I've had that same realization too. Like I said, I mean, you don't realize it until like you get older and then you're like, wow, like 
my parents, like you have to respect your parents like a lot more once you realize kind of what they went through. <laughs> yeah. Like you just, there's no way for you to comprehend how difficult it is for your parents until you've had that, you've had to do it. Right. Uh, well, I, I, Hey man, I wish you the, the best of luck in the world with that. Like, I mean, thank you. It's if you need, if you need to chat about it, I, I don't have a ton of advice, but I got a little bit. So yeah, <laughs> I'm happy to help where I can. Oh, so, so like, what are you what are you up to in the off season, man? Like I know you really got into to off road and uh and and like some of the the I bowl is it considered bouldering or rock bouncing at rock that crawling? Point? Yeah, rock crawling. Okay, I wasn't yeah, sure. I know there's crawling. like a divide between like rock bouncing and rock crawling. I think it just comes down to speed, right? right? right. Yeah, this, the the rock bouncing is like kind of insane, like horsepower, crazy suspension, like catching air. Seems like breaking a lot of stuff all the time. Rock crawlings, it's a little, lot slower, more calculated. We're going up things that are steeper and probably a lot like harder to get up, but we're just going up them slower. The mm -hmm. rock bouncers are kind of like, there's like a launch ramp basically, like <laughs> pointed at a hill and floor it. And like, let's see what happens. And it usually ends up with like five rolls coming down the mountain or a few of the guys make it and then it's cheers across. But I guess it's cheers even when they roll. Yeah. Like those guys that go to those events, they like love watching the action and people rolling is part of the action. But yeah, I mean, the rock crawling is amazing. It's a, it's like a relaxation kind of like getaway. I mean, you, you're still feeling that adrenaline and that like pucker factor of like, whoa, oh, like don't lose it. Don't roll. Like there's some serious consequences involved. But like sometimes we're up on a 20, 30 foot like hill. And if you roll, it'd be like four backflips over to where <laughs> you don't want to do that. So, but it's like slow and calculated to where like you can like start aligning like, ah, oh, that doesn't feel good. Like back it up a little, shift it over a couple inches and then try that line. And you know, hmm. it's a uh, super technical and it's very, you got to concentrate. I mean, everything's line, you know, like tire placement is everything. I mean, some of the lines we're going up, it's like an inch or two the wrong way and you could be on your lid. So it's uh, definitely a wild experience. Uh, same, same like drifting. I love taking people for rides in it and just like letting them experience something. Like you pull up to an obstacle and you look up and you're like, no way. Like, <laughs> you're going to drive up that? It's like, it defies like laws of physics you look at something like how are we going to get this four thousand pound vehicle up that hill and it's just somehow it just works and you just make it work but uh it doesn't always work so yeah. sometimes you end up on your lid do you do you think like your maybe like your vehicle awareness from drifting like just translated into that like super easily kind of like so I, i've wheeled with uh justin pollock a lot and uh he was like dude we're drivers i'm like yeah, you're right. We are drivers. <laughs> We're like, it did trans. Like, I mean, if you can drive something, you can probably drive anything, whether it's, you know, a side by side or a semi or, you know, whatever. You like, like you said, you have that vehicle awareness that you just know how to control the vehicle. And I guess it does kind of translate to kind of whatever I guess you set your mind to. Like, you could, I mean, drive whatever. Like, I, I love driving forklifts. I like driving my <laughs> forklift around. I got a tractor. I drive my tractor around, you know, like all these levers. The the buggies are kind of like that too because we got front steer, rear steer. You got front dig, rear dig. You got all these different levers and stuff. And it's almost like operating a tractor. You're in there like rah, 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 all these different switches and levers that control different, you know, aspects of the vehicle to where it's... Uh, a lot different. It's slow pace, but it's still exciting and it's still challenging. Yeah, it's got to be like you said, like concentration wise. Like it's just you just can't break, right? Like until yeah. until you get a rest spot, it's just like no, I need to, I need to have everything within reach. I need to be able to make those adjustments instantly. So, hmm. yeah, yeah. I've never, I've never. I mean, I've gone off roading and shit, but like never to that extent. So. Right, right. Yeah. I mean, off-roading in general, it's just fun. Like I like all types of off-roading. It doesn't have to be extreme. It can just be cruising down the forest roads to go to a lake or go, you know, to a hike or whatever, you know, just getting outdoors, seeing new places. And uh, yeah, I love, I love that kind of stuff. Just the experience, right? Like it doesn't have to like just going and doing stuff instead of, you know, not <laughs> like really. Yeah. Yeah. I went snowboarding yesterday and the day before that was awesome. Sick. I haven't, uh, I haven't snowboarded much like growing up in Hawaii. And uh, now that I've been in the States, I've either been in Nevada or Arizona and it doesn't have the best snow out here, but it was still fun. Yeah. I still mean, a good time. Up in Flagstaff's got to be pretty good. Yeah. yeah, That's where we were. We were in Flag yesterday. Okay. And uh, it's, uh, 
it was a bit patchy in places like at the top it was like rocks exposed and stuff from how it is normally but yeah. still made the best out of it. it was great it was like 50 degrees sun was out like blue skies nice it was like actually getting hot and i was like wow getting hot out here <laughs> did you do you ever like come from any surfing culture at hawaii or uh, a little bit like not like what you'd think when you think of hawaii but yeah i got on surfboards and you know played around but once i got into cars it was like lost yeah. All, I, I so I just in anything else. Yeah, it's like yeah, this is my thing now. Like yeah, yeah. no time for surfing. Uh, the, the reason I was wondering is like I came from snowboarding. I've been snowboarding my whole life, and then just like two weeks ago, I got on like a wave rider and tried to like surf. I know it's not proper surfing, but as close as I can get where I live. And mm-hmm. I thought it would translate way more than it did. Like I was like, I've been snowboarding for you know like twenty years. Like I should be able to do this just fine. Nope. Not even close. Like I, dude, I bailed so hard so many times. And, and when asking the guy, I'm like, dude, I've been snowboarding. He's like, yeah, that's why you suck. Like you think it should operate this way. Like you think you can do this and it should operate like you're on snow. He goes, but this is way less stable than snow. And I was like, oh, Hmm. well, fuck. I wish I would have known that. (laughs) And my 10 year old is doing fine. He's like absolutely crushing me. Cause like he doesn't know any better. He doesn't have any fear. He doesn't know. He's just learning it now. He's like, this is, this is all he knows. Yeah. He's just. Does it? Yeah, he's like three runs in and he's already up and, you know, starting to carve back and forth. And I'm like 10 in. I can nice. barely stay on the board. So that's, yeah. that's why I was wondering. I, di- I didn't know if like the translation from surfing to snowboarding was easier than the other way around. I, don't, I can't even remember. It's been so long. <laughs> been so long. Yeah. I'm a lot older than I look, like you said. So yeah, I can't even remember. Yeah. I You, you still got to so explain long. that. I mean, I, dude, I don't, I, you also, I mean, don't like, I know this sounds weird, but you got ripped in the last year and like that seemed to have come out of nowhere. I don't know. I don't know you that like that well to I, be like, I, yeah, I gained 25 pounds in the past like year and a half, which is pretty good. It's like mainly muscle. Definitely. Uh, yeah. I don't know, like maybe after having a kid, you know, like you realize, wow, like I got to use it or lose it kind of deal. Like I want to stay healthy. Mm-hmm. I've definitely like been a lot more conscious of like what I'm eating, what I'm putting in my body. Um, and yeah, just kind of like do it, do it for the longevity of it all, you know, just try to stay healthy, um, be a good example, you know, for our our kid too, just to make sure that she knows what she's eating Mm. and being active and, you know, that kind of stuff. Cause yeah, it's definitely important. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, it was, I don't know. It was just wild to me. Like I, maybe I just didn't keep up on what you were up to and then, it just seemed like out of nowhere, there was like a photo that got posted with you that a shirt on. I was like, hang on, what the hell? Because like, you were always kind of a smaller guy. You were like- just, Oh, I've been yeah. skinny my whole life, for sure. Yeah. For sure. And I I hated it. And I guess I you know, never really thought about it that you can like change it. Like you can't. <laughs> yeah, you, yeah. You can, you don't have to be skinny. It's just, you got to make up your mind to do some things like how you eat and like what you're doing. And yeah, you can. Anybody can do it. It's it's not easy though. I mean, it's it's hard work, but- do, it, it, it's possible. Do you, do you think it changed anything on the on the driving side? Like we see, like Matt and Ryan are two guys I I think of that are like very health conscious, workout conscious, and arguably their careers have gotten better the more they've done that. Like, do you do you think there's any correlation to that, or do you, do you notice anything yeah, like that? Yeah, I I would say so. I mean, because a lot of it, you know, it's just like dedication and like like working at something and just being able to focus because when you think about going to the gym, a lot of times you're like, I don't want to go to the gym. But then if you have that, like, you just do it kind of attitude, you can, like I said, if you just make your mind up to do something, you can just do it. Mm. So like almost more on the mental fortitude part and less on the yeah. like physical. Yeah. I don't think like drifting's physical. Like there's not much going on in the car that like you can, you could or couldn't do if you were working out. Like anybody can drift a car. Like, I mean, you could be a, like, some of these little kids, you know, like, yeah. it's crazy seeing some of these new generation of kids are like 12, 13 years old and they're like shredding like pros. You're like, wow, like, yeah, you don't have to be like a full grown man to like drive a car really well. So or, it is a pretty awesome sport that like anybody can kind of do it. Yeah. You know? Yeah, dude, I'm pumped for like Odie's kids. Like he's already got right. them out driving and I'm like, man, we're not far off. <laughs> like <laughs> Custom Miata over here. Drive it around the backyard. That's that's the thing, man. Like that's where we're at. Where you know the sports at an age now where it's like it's these drivers' kids, man. Like 
there's a there's a solid chance. I mean, whether you want her to or not, like in 10, 15 years, like we could see your daughter competing in FD. Like, right. right. That's not even out of the realm of possibility. Unless you're I just like, no, you're not doing this. <laughs> I think I went to Ireland in like 2014 and uh, saw Connor when he was like, I don't know, I think he was like 11 or 12. Like, and I was like, it was mind blowing to me to like see this kid. I'm like, wait, like, you drift this car? It was like a fully built, you know, S13. I'm like, what? Yeah. And Thomas Kylie, like these kids were like 13 years old and they got like FD level cars and they're shredding these cars. I'm like, this is insane. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, it's awesome for sure. And then who's this kid that's coming in from Japan? Yeah. Here Manoa. Here, 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 yeah. Yeah. How Funny. old is he? Uh, 14, maybe 15. Yeah. I mean, it's like, I seen him like drifting with his mom and dad and stuff. That's so awesome. Yeah. Bro shreds too. Like I've been that, like he's on the list of people to obviously like get on the show and, and like, you know, mm -hmm. once everything's like all official and slated and stuff, but like been doing some research, I'm like, damn, like quick too. like in, in basically in drifting, just up the ranks one year after another. So yeah. it's like, yeah, it's, it's wild. It's, I don't know. I they also, they've got so much information that like, you know, you've, you've been developing all these years where you can be like, here's, you know, like I said, like 20 years of knowledge. There you go. Don't do this shit. Yeah. Just do this thing and then go mm -hmm. from there. Right. It was a lot harder 20 years ago trying to like pursue this for sure. <laughs> yeah. The knowledge wasn't there. The parts weren't there. It just wasn't as readily available. And now it's like you said, you could just get all that knowledge and you're like, okay, this is what I should do. This is what works. Let's try this. Yeah. There was like a couple of forums that had information and like, that's all you guys could work off of. Right. Like now, you know, you go on YouTube, pick any chassis and go like <laughs> drifting and it'll, here's yeah. a full build on how to do it. <clears throat> yeah. yeah I, I'm excited. I'm, I'm super pumped to see where the sport goes. Like it's only, right. a, it's, I mean, this is like the worst it's going to be moving forward. It's only going to get better than from here. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It'll be, It'll be wild. What What are your, like, I know you said you're not sure about this year coming up, but like looking at like a Connor Shanahan, like what is that? If, I mean, I know he also hasn't confirmed anything officially, but like, does that kind of shit get you pumped up? Like just seeing drivers you've never driven with and be like, okay, like now I want to, I want to try this. Oh yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. Like I took a couple of years off or actually it was just one year back in 17 mm -hmm. And that's, I think, the year that James came in. Yeah. And missing that season, I was like super stoked to come back in the next year and be able to drive in the same circuit with James because, you know, the guy's amazing. Yeah. Like, driving's phenomenal to where to drive with drivers like that, that's, you know, what you want to do to where same like with Connor. Like Connor coming in, it's like should get all the drivers amped up because you get to drive with someone at that level, like that consistency, obviously, like, you know, he's been doing it since he was like a little kid. It's just like, um, second nature, you know, as it is to all of us, but yeah, it's just nice to have like new talent in the mix, you know, like he's definitely proven himself to be one of the best in the world. So it's awesome to like see drivers like that coming in and competing in FD. Well, and they just, they have like <clears throat> such a capacity to just get so much better too. Right. Where like you look at like their age and you're like, oh, you still have like another 10 years of experience to gain. Like that's, that's the part. It's great. It's crazy. Yeah, they're they're only going to get better. So it's like for everybody I lost else. You there it's for like, a second. Pardon? No, oh, I said I lost you there for oh, a second. Okay. I don't know if it was my connection nah, or something. That's no, all good. Um. So what what's your like day to day like right now? Like off season? Like what are like, like what are you up to? <laughs> like obviously we get like the the kind of curated Instagram social media feeds of of everybody, but like. I'm so bad with social media. I like don't even post. <laughs> just, I just live in my life. And like I guess I went to Hawaii in December for a couple of weeks. Uh, got to chill on the beach, go on some sick hikes. Um, what did we come back and then did an event in Vegas, like two days after I got back. Um, been like you said, like working out gym, that's Monday, Wednesday, Friday, two hours. I've uh, been mountain biking a lot. Um, rock crawling whenever I can. Um, obviously dad life playing, picking her up, dropping her off. She's going to like a Montessori school now. So that, um, taking her 
places, park, all that stuff. Um, to stand busy. I have, yeah, I have so many, like, there's so much to work on, whether it's drift cars or fun cars, like trucks or trailers. I mean, there's just like more than I can keep up on. And I don't, like in Vegas, I kind of had like a good support system. I had like a bunch of friends, everybody would come by and like, it was just like a cool hangout spot because Vegas is like 30 minutes across the valley. Yeah. And any given day, you could have like three, four people stop by the shop and just hang out, shoot the shit, work on cars, do whatever. Now I'm in Arizona and I'm like kind of in the sticks. Like I'm out here by myself. Um, I'm like 15 minutes from a grocery store or a gas station and uh, I'm not close to anything or anybody. <laughs> so don't get a lot of like visitors. Um, so I'm kind of like out here working on the stuff by myself most of the time, which, you know, I, I, I can get stuff done by myself, but it's always nice to have like a hand or even just somebody to like keep you company, you know, mm. to where it does get kind of, uh, it bogs you down a bit, you know, working by yourself all the time. But well, can I, what can I ask is. why the change? Like why, why from Vegas to Arizona? Um, so after we had the kid, it just made sense because it takes a village, they say. And uh, my girl's whole family was from Arizona. So sh they're still all out here. And uh, it just made sense to get closer to family. Hmm. And uh, yeah, that was the main inspiration for that move. Also, like always had been the dream to like have the shop at the house. Ah. And now I have, I have the shop at the house. So the whole operation is based out of the house, which it's super convenient for being able to like, be working and then just like come in for lunch, hang out with the family or, you know, do whatever needs to get done as to where like in Vegas, even though I was close, I was only 10 minutes from my house, from the shop. It was still like, I'd leave in the morning and I would come home at night. Like mm. I never really like would go home for lunch. Cause it's like, once you open up the shop, it had the gate, the you know, the alarm, the, the bay door. And like, every, once everything's open, I'm kind of like there, like I didn't like to close down and then leave and then come back to where now it's like everything's just on one property, which it's nice too for the overhead because, yeah. you know, instead of rent, renting a shop, like my mortgage at this house is what the shop rent costs in Vegas to where now it's like I'm building equity and working from home, like being able to work from home, mm -hmm. like have the whole, the whole operation out of the backyards. Definitely. It's, you know, got its pluses, but then it's also got its minuses. Yeah. Like. Um, I mean, this might come as a shock to some people, but like the whole podcasting thing is out of my house. And it's like the, the, uh, the ability to like just work anytime is great, but it's also such a trap because you're like, I can just walk a few steps and then start working again. It could be like nine o'clock at night. And then you like, oh, it's going to get like, I just got to do something quick. And then you look at the clock, like, cool, I've been here for three hours. It's midnight now or whatever. Like that's, that's the part that, kind of sucks with having the ability to work so close. Right. Or it could work the opposite way too, where you're like, oh, I'm just going to go inside and like hang out for a bit, or I'm going to go get a bite to eat and then just end up getting like stuck. And you're like, oh, yeah. well, never mind. I'm shop's closed for the day. Yeah. Yeah. Like that's, or, yeah. that's definitely, yeah, dude, I do that all the time. I'll like go upstairs, like get a cup of coffee. And then next thing I know, I'm like, oh, I need some lunch and I'll just sit down for a little bit. And I'm like, I've been here for two hours. Like I should be getting some more shit done. <laughs> Look, we all enjoy wearing FD merch. I know I do. If I am not wearing a completely black outfit, minus this hat that has about 100 different names for the color, teal, seafoam, whatever you want to call it. But when I'm not wearing this, what do I got on? FD merch, of course. So head over to shopfd.com. Use the coupon code PODCAST24, just the numbers. Don't spell it all out. Save yourself 20%. So that is shopfd.com. Get yourself some awesome merch. Maybe a skateboard deck. Maybe a... Uh, can we bring bucket hats back? Let's do bucket hats. Everyone go get a bucket hat. And if you do, let me know. And let me know that uh, you save 20% by using podcast 24 at checkout. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I get it. I mean, that's the the takes a village thing. Like, I'm, I'm right there with you. I mean, we moved to like six hours from where I grew up to like be closer mm -hmm. to my wife's family and stuff. Like, we're super far away. So like, I, yeah, I do. I, I get that decision. It's not easy, especially definitely, like. Definitely help. Yeah. Especially if like all your infrastructure is where you came from, right? It's, yeah. Ah. Yeah, moving out here was tough for the program, but like better for the family aspect of it all. Yeah. I mean, it's tough for the racing because I, like you said, that whole structure that I had built in Vegas and like what I was comfortable with, like running my whole program, now it's not there. Like I still use like, like the engine building shop, 
the the rap shop like they're still in vegas i'll just take my car up there and like my buddy wraps it in vegas still Mm -hmm. but it's like the little stuff of like oh i just need this one thing really quick like when you're 15 minutes from a grocery store like there's nothing you're gonna get real quick like no (laughs) That's that's a half. That's where like piece. Vegas. I was so close. Like my shop was right off of the strip, central, like in the middle of the valley, to where anything I needed, it was five minutes. I mean, metal shop, welding supply, paint store, everything. Like har- best hardware stores, like all right there. Like mm-hmm. anything you needed, you had it right then and there. To where like now it's like I'm an hour away. I'm an hour away from most things in Phoenix. Yeah. Is is Vegas but like it's private? Yeah. It's super peaceful, super peace and quiet. Like I can go outside and be like working in my shop and not see a single person all day. So it's, it's chill. Like nobody bothers you. Like you don't have, like Vegas was getting really weird. Like it, it is like, it's, uh, kind of scary sometimes to where, you know, we'd have people cruising up and like rummaging through our like dumpster and like it was always a worry, you know, as to where mm. out here, it's like, it's like farmlands all around us. It's like super chill. Hmm. I was gonna. I was gonna ask that. Like, I've only been to Vegas a handful of times, and it's never. I've obviously never lived there. Like, what? What's that like living in the biggest party city in the world? <laughs> when when you live there, you like don't really do the whole Vegas. Like, what people think Vegas like? Yeah, Vegas, go to the Strip. Like, when you live there, you're like stay as far away from the Strip as you can. <laughs> it's like a money vacuum. Like, it's just like everything's gonna cost you. You go to Strip, you're gonna pay. Like, doesn't matter what it is, food, drinks, whatever. Like. But like when you go there for vacation, like you expect that. So you're like, oh yeah, let's go party. Right. But like when you live there, you're like, no, nah, no, nah, unless it's a special occasion, you know, somebody's birthday, somebody comes into town, you go out, but it wasn't like the, the daily routine or anything like that. Now you weren't, you weren't hitting the craps tables every day? No. <laughs> Damn. No. <laughs> good thing. Good thing I wasn't into gambling because that would have been a bad situation. Yeah. I got a, I got a buddy of mine who like, like definitely into gambling and like, he's like, you can never take me there. I'll never leave. He's like, I, I know, right. I know what'll happen. Like never, never take me there. And I'm like, okay, good to know. Yeah. I don't know. I've, I've never got into gambling. So for me, it's like going to Vegas is kind of cool, but I'm definitely more of a food person. So it's like to go to the restaurants, that was, that's where I'm going to spend my money. At least I know what I'm going to get. Something I miss about Vegas. They have really good food. Yeah. And it's available like almost any time of the day. And you can get like, all you can eat Korean barbecue at like two in the morning if you want it. Yeah. There's now everything. I'm out here, I'm like, there's nothing. There's nothing around me. Like it's it's so bad. But part of the trade off, I guess. Yeah. Are you gonna like do the the Turk thing and like pave the driveway and build like a little drift area, or has that already happened? No, no, not not doing that. I miss that. The old shop that we had where uh we were in Vegas and we had that whole skid pad in front of the shop. That was it was trouble. <laughs> Definitely. It was, it was trouble. trouble. It was trouble. This is like a time waster, right? You're like, I can just go and Oh, totally. I'd be like working and friends would come by and like, you know, pull up front, rev their engine. Hey, let's drift. I'm just like, I'm working. And then I'm like, you know what? Drifting sounds pretty fun right now. Okay. One set of tires. Yeah. And one set turns into like, you know, all day. And you're like, wow, I just wasted my whole day. And then you end up breaking something or tapping the wall and you're like, oh, now I got to fix this. Not only did I not complete anything now i like set myself back because i gotta fix all this stuff i broke <laughs> that's fair so, yeah I that's mean, dangerous uh, the drift at the house or at the shop is definitely definitely dangerous i don't think my neighbors would appreciate it either like i said it's super quiet it's super quiet out here <laughs> yeah you don't want to be that guy right like you don't want to be no. that neighbor where it's like yeah when you find out a professional race car driver is moving in next door you're like oh shit like how's this gonna go right <laughs> An occasional test down the street, I will say that yeah. happens, but nothing, you know, frequent. Like yeah. if it's like just ready to leave and I'm like, okay, just do a quick hit. And it's not even like drifting. It's just like, just a quick pull, mm-hmm. like make sure the engine's running right. Make sure this is that. And like, okay, now it's, we know that it's going to go load it up. Like rarely do I uh, <laughs> get to actually test the car anymore before we go to the track. Yeah. I like, I like the the rad Dan set up, like just the two beat up, like Miata skeletons like that, that seems to, to kind of be the the best way to do it. All right. Yeah. Just some low yeah, power. Little part. Yeah. yeah. Like I saw Daigo's got the Miatas in, uh, yeah. in Japan. Just like smashing Miatas around that small little lot. It looks super fun. Dude, that, that looks like the best time. <laughs> like 
I'm sure I'm sure driving at, at like 10 tenths and some crazy car and shit is fun. Like, don't get me wrong, like nothing taken away from that. But there is something about just not caring at all and just knowing that you can beat the oh, hell out right. of this car, right? Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. I mean, that's kind of like what it takes to just like learn and get good is to like not think about it and not worry about it. You know, because if you're worried about something, then that's going to be in the back of your mind as to where you're like, oh, don't mess up. Don't mess up. It's going to, you're going to have to fix this or whatever it is. Like it's kind of got to put that all out of your head and just go. And that's when you're going to really progress and learn the quickest is when you can just not think about anything else, but exactly what you're trying to do. I, I mean, I tell people if you're going to drive at like that high of a level, you have to be ready to rebuild that car at the end of the weekend. Like you have to drive, like you have everything available to rebuild that car at the end of the weekend. Like that's, that's it. It's the only way, I mean, in my opinion, at least like you're going to progress to that point. That's why like it always frustrates me when you see guys that like way overbuild, but like financially strain themselves to way overbuild. And you know, like, look, man, one wall tap, like you can't even afford to fix that. Like, yeah, you could I've take seen that it far too many times. Oh yeah. Yeah, exactly. I, I mean, I'm sure. Yeah. I mean, it's, I've had clients, I've had clients do that and like working on a customer's car and you know, they got to have, FD this and then like 800 horsepower. And I'm like, you don't need that. Like, have you ever drifted? Like, no, no, but I need that. I'm like, no, you, what you need is to like, go kick the shit out of an SR like 240 and learn how to like figure out what makes a car drift and like how to control it, how to use the handbrake, how to, you know, actually control a car. You know, you don't need 800 horsepower before you know how to control a car. Yeah. Especially if you can't afford it. Like, yeah. 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 Don't get me wrong. If you come from means and like, you can afford to rebuild a hundred thousand dollar drift car a couple times a year. Like, eh, go for it. I don't care. Like, not my problem. But like, yeah, it's it's the guys. But it's always still good to it's yeah. still good to like start from like a a low level build and learn how to control the car because you'll learn things trying to make a KA twenty four drift that you won't have to like learn if you have an eight hundred horsepower car. You're just gonna mask everything with all that horsepower. That's where you didn't learn like the fundamentals of like, what does a clutch kick do when you're running out of steam? You know, what does a left foot brake do or what, you know, how to basically make this car drift that doesn't want to drift. Mm. If you build an FD level car, the car wants to drift. You floor it and it wants to drift. You don't know how to like control it. So it looks cool because it's got the like grunt behind it. It's got the go to where it'll smoke the tires in any gear, but then you're not, you don't know how to control it. You don't know how to like work momentum and figure out flow flow of tracks and like how to you know make it through something as smooth as you can without just using all that power to like fall back on i think i think a lot of people don't realize like how often you guys at the pro level are doing things in that car that are, are i mean are very basic drifting things right like it's not like there's some crazy advanced technique that you're using as an fd driver like still clutch kicks still momentum changes still quick e-brake pulls and transition like there's no secret sauce it's just being super good at the basics and knowing how to use yeah. all of them at any time yep yeah you got to have a lot of tools in your bag and you got to be able to use them fluidly and at uh, you know split second notice you know everything's got to be seamless there's it's so dynamic there's so much going on in any given drift that it's like you got to be able to use any one of these tools without like being able to show that you're having to do it you just do it there's no like lapse in in time. It's just it just happens to where that's how everything needs to be. Is that like when you feel like you're at your best is like in that state where like you don't even know you're doing stuff and just the lap is over? Yeah, definitely. When you just do it, that's that's when it's the best. Like somebody asked you, like, what do you do when you come in? Like, I'll be the worst teacher <laughs> for drifting. <laughs> I'm like, uh, I'm trying to think like, what was I doing? I, I don't really even remember. I kind of just went in and did it. Like, <laughs> it's like too much to think about. I try to like teach my, my girl how to drift and she says, I'm all trying to yell at her. I'm like, I'm not yelling at you. I'm telling you to gas it, gas it. <laughs> you gotta gas it. If you don't push the gas, you're not going to spin the tires. <laughs> oh, that's too funny. <laughs> Floor it, floor it. Yeah. It's loud. I'm not yelling. I'm just being loud. Like, <laughs> yeah, I got to talk over the engine. Like, so I got this little beater car now. It's a S13 with a 1J. So we're going to try again. It's a little <laughs> bit less of a handful. It's a little bit more manageable. So we're going to see, uh, she can, 
try to swing this thing a little bit. But I took it to Fuel Fest and it was amazing because I did 20 laps on a pair of tires and I didn't turn the car off the whole time. Two hours. Jesus. Two hours at Fuel Fest, I let the car run. I didn't turn it off. Dude, that's, that's, I mean, that's, that's what people need to be like building a car for. Like, yeah, I got the car for like 10 grand. <laughs> As, as is like angle kit, handbrake, suspension, 1J, running, cage, seats, like a ready to go pro am drift car for huh. 10 grand. And like that's, that's like FD cars are great. They're super fun. I love it. It's, but the maintenance and then the amount of time you're driving versus prep and tire changing, you're driving the car for like, you know, a minute versus like an hour of prep as mm -hmm. to where, you get a little seat time car and you can just drive it and drive it and drive it and keep driving it. I'm like, wow, the tires have cords. I'm going to do four more laps and it still <laughs> works. Like just keep going, you know, like you can't do that on an FD level car. You know, the tire gets like down, you got to go change tires. You know, you got to keep it cool. Like mm -hmm. there's just so much going on. And then you're thinking like, man, am I just beating the crap out of this hundred thousand dollar car for fun, mm -hmm. for kicks? It's kind of like, you know, doesn't really make sense. I yeah. think, yeah, I think we just need to aim for smiles per dollar. That's it. Like how much fun Definitely. can you have for as cheap as possible? That's it. Definitely. Yeah. 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 I like, Definitely. I like that idea. I do. I, I like that the, the one JS chassis, like that's, that's phenomenal. I mean, it's got to make like what, maybe 300 horsepower, maybe four. Yeah. Like, three, three, 300. It's, it's eight pounds of boost. It's uh pretty stock. <laughs> <laughs> and arguably but it's enough. Yeah. It's enough. It's enough to have fun. In, and it was keeping up with a lot of the other cars out there. So it, it works, you know, and it's like you said, smiles per dollar. You're there. You're really efficient. <laughs> I think that's, I think that's the peak. Like, I think that's where people can like, there's like an interest in the sport. There's learning the sport. And then there's like that, that falling in love with the sport, I think happens at that 300 horsepower mark where it's like just enough that like you can really drive the car. You can do a lot with the car. Power is now a thing that's available but it's not so far that shit's breaking and, and you know, you're tearing stuff apart and you're right, worried right. about because the car. You can get lost in that like FD build. Like, like you said, people wanting to, they want this FD level car, but it's like, do you need that to do what you want to do? Yeah. Like you probably don't need that to go play around with the friends. Like you should probably just get something that's cheap and economical and it'll be more fun, yeah. honestly, because you'll be fixing it less usually because the low powered cars, they just don't break as much as the high powered cars. I think like the most dangerous term in especially cars, but like in a lot of things is like, while I'm in there, like, you know, like, uh, like, oh, I, I, you know, while I'm in there, I'm just going to do this to the engine or while I'm in there, I'm going to yeah. like add a cage or while I'm in there, I'm gonna, like, <laughs> dude, it's, I, I'm literally going through it right now. There's a car that I'm building and it's like, I'm like starting to get parts together and I'm so torn about caging it. But I also know if I cage the whole car, it, that's what's going to happen. It's a slippery slope. There's a slippery slope because once you strip a car and you gut it and do the cage, then it just opens a door. Well, I'm already in here. I might as well do this. Exactly. I know it all, all far too well. I've done it many times myself. So, yeah. But it's, it's just how it is. I've, yeah. I, it's, it's so, I'm like, well, like I need seats. I definitely need seats. Like I'm not going to drive this with stock seats. But then that means I need harnesses. So it's like, okay, do I just get like a harness bar or like to get a half cage? Well, if I'm doing a half cage, I need to do a whole cage. And then it's like, well, that means I need to do wiring, which like, okay, well, I might as well go standalone. Well, then it doesn't matter what engine I run. Like in, in like the span of an hour, that's my brain. And it's like- It's a full snowball avalanche. Yeah. yeah <laughs> I spent three grand on this car and I'm about to spend $40,000 more, like, which I don't have. So like, why am I even, why am I even thinking about it? Like- <laughs> All right. Keep it simple. Keep yeah. it simple. Have fun. Yeah, I know. I know. But I need to see, which means I need to, you know, like it's just. <laughs> uh, my little street car, demo car, whatever. I, I have seats in it and I just have the stock seatbelt. I like took the buckle off of the stock seatbelt and just like bolted it into the seat rail on the side and just have like seatbelt. Oh yeah. I'm like a bucket seat. Yeah. I don't know. Like I've driven it all different places with it and nobody really seems to care. So <sighs> man, that's, that's it's possible. That might that might need to happen. I don't know. The stock seats in this are keep leather. it simple. Yeah, keep it. Yeah, you know, seat seat for sure. Like drifting, any kind of spirited driving without a seat sucks because then you're like flying all over the car. You end up like getting tired just from 
trying to brace yourself with nothing to brace yourself to wear a seat, definitely. But you might be able to get around the seatbelt thing. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, the the bruise on my left leg, I had a 540i that was drifting for a bit. And the bruise on my left leg from just trying to brace myself was crazy. Like I would, I'd finish a day and I could barely walk. And my whole left, like knee down was just beat to shit. And I'm like, what uh, am I, I, doing? I know the feeling. I know the feeling. <laughs> yeah. And you, and you can't, like, you can't clutch kick if you're trying to like use your knee to like brace you through the corner. Like it's just not going to happen. Right. Yeah. I don't know. Deep seat, stock seatbelt. That might need to happen. It, it works. Yeah. And you find a seat company that can just like put like the, the beanie on like the headrest area. Like, so <laughs> if somebody's really good at embroidery, like I'll send you the fabric, just embroider it to the top of the, the seat. So it looks <laughs> like I'm wearing it. <laughs> oh man. Yeah. Um, actually speaking of, I want to like, I want to get into like your merch. Cause like, I feel like you sell out like every round. Like there is, there is always people there. What is, what's the secret to good merch, man? Like, is there, is there something you're doing that just gets people to go? Or are you just like, um, what it is? well, hard tune, we like collab with hard tune and they make really nice stuff. Um, also work with Drift Raff out of Vegas and okay. he's always got cool ideas. He's been doing a lot of Rome stuff too. Right. And, uh, he's got cool ideas, you know, it's like really fun and like just, like upbeat kind of like good vibe you know good vibe merch you know to where like i think people like you know the bright colors and stuff like that so i don't know and you know maybe it's you know people just want want some of our stuff i don't i don't really know for sure but i think you got to keep it fun too at the same time yeah like more than just like a team shirt like more than just like yeah. what everybody like on the team's wearing like that's great i i think those sell really well but like do something that represents you that is more than just, you know, your logo and some sponsor logos on it. Yeah. yeah like I started wearing sun hats around the house, like doing yard work and stuff. And I'm like, we need to make these and we need to sell these at events because like I wear them. Like, I think they're great. Like it gives you like a little umbrella, you know, you're out baking in the sun at some of these events. Like we sold 125 sun hats in Seattle. We sold Jeez. out. It was crazy. Like, I was like, wow. Cause I took, I think 50 to Long Beach and I was like, oh, we're not going to sell that many. We sold out the first day. I was like, oh my gosh, I should have brought more. <laughs> but then we started, we started bringing more and we brought like more and then we still sold out. We're like, holy crap, this is crazy. Like, how many more do we need to bring? Like, how do you carry that much inventory along with the whole, uh, operate a race operation? You know, we got enough stuff to try to like bring for the race operation. Like, it's hard bringing that kind of inventory of merch in the same trailer. I'm packing it all in there. Dude, I picked the wrong headgear to be my thing. Like the sun hat should have been it. <laughs> <laughs> if I go back, that's what I, if I, if I ever get the time travel, I'm going back. Like, look, I'm switching to a sun hat. The, the beanie's great, but fuck, it gets hot. So yeah, I, you're on, you're on something there with the the thing or the Larry Chen hat, which was good. Like with the neck drape. Oh yeah. 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 That was like, he started wearing that and like everybody in the media pits like, Oh, this oh, makes a lot yeah. of sense. Cause I mean, same thing. You're out there baking, you yeah. know, like it's hot. The sun's beating on you. Like have some kind of cover is definitely going to be a huge difference. Yeah. Yeah. Just be practical. I mean, there's like that practicality versus style thing, right? Like I'm just not practical with this unless we get a, an event where it's really cold. Um, kind of shit out of luck so well, sometimes it's cold at long beach sometimes it's cold yeah you know. it was good and then there was st louis where i almost died so <laughs> oh yeah i was gonna say wait what st louis no oh, it's, it's never so cold hot, and then it like well, rained never, and it's just like absorbed everything summer. and then I, yeah. it was yeah it was a bad move but i think i'm stuck with it now at this point so yeah i yeah I just love everybody who thinks that I'm bald under the hat. It's like my favorite, my favorite company. You're like, bro, just to admit you're bald. I'm like, do you have a beautiful, do you have like a, do you have a bunch of them or is it there one? Uh, so like the original is in a, this is going to sound dumb. It's in a frame in my office. Like, wow. and it's like, it was literally found at like a lost and found. And oh, wow. I don't know if I've ever like told this story on the air. Like people have asked, but like when we started recording the show, I wasn't sure like how everything was like going to go. And I wanted to make sure that I could like have continuity where if I had to go back and reshoot something, I was always wearing the same stuff. And then we also like bulk shot the first three or four episodes. So, and it was like over two days I recorded four episodes. So I had all the same stuff on. And now if I had to go back and like re-record or there was a problem, I could just wear the same thing. It was really easy. So 
I have a whole bunch of black beanies, but if I wear a black hat with this background, everything disappears. My, my shirt already disappears on the background. Mm-hmm. So the only hat that I had was a hat my wife found in a lost and found, and it was one of these. So I put it on, and then, I don't know, like the first batch of episodes came out, and someone commented about like how much they hated the hat and how dumb it was. And I was like, well, no, now I'm sticking with it. Like, Ugh. screw you. Like, like <laughs> It's petty, but... Yeah, and then I, I I struck up a deal with the company that made them for last year. So uh, in uh, yeah, in Irwindale, we had a hundred of them that I donate. Like they, the company oh, sent wow. me. So I just gave them out. Like if you looked in the stands at Irwindale, there was a hundred of these hats all in the stands. I have a photo of it somewhere. So it's like you could like go through wow. and like pick them all out. Yeah. So now now I'm working on like developing my own like. Yeah. This is actually uh this is like a little fun piece of insider information. This is actually the demo of my own version of it. This was like the oh, the nice. test one. Yeah. So I gotta fix yeah. some stuff on it, but I still have a bunch of the ones the other company gave me. I'm not gonna say their name because they, they didn't pay me. So so <laughs> people can figure it out. But yeah, like I still have a bunch of them. We gave away a bunch and yeah, but the the original now is very beat up, super worn. There's like <laughs> holes in it and it's it's sitting in a frame in, in my office now. So, yeah, I don't know. Just, just branding. I I come from marketing, so yeah. I look at it and I'm it's like, stuck. yeah, I'm just now stuck with it. So, yeah. <laughs> oh man. Um. So I heard a a funny story about a car fire in New Jersey that you were worried about one very particular part of the car. Um. I I don't know if this is too deep of a cut, but. Apparently, of the entire car, you are more concerned about the turn signal than anything else. I don't remember this story. Let me see if I can. What year was this? Ah, man. It was a little bit ago. It was on your S14. Okay. I guess you had a super rare turn signal, and of the entire car that had issues, that was your biggest concern. I don't remember. Ah, I don't remember. TV. This might be some story. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I'm gonna check my references. The the, the <laughs> person who told me, hopefully they listen. I'm like, man, we'll have to we'll have to we'll have to dig into this one a little bit more. <laughs> I mean, maybe there was something to do with like corner lights because I kind of had a thing like I think it might S14, have been a corner light. The S14 because that is like a like kind of blinker thing, but like I like the S14 fronts, but if you don't have the corner light, it's like it doesn't work. Like it, it ties in, it ties in that front end and uh, they suck because they always like want to fall out. Like you clip the bumper and then that corner light wants to fall out to where maybe it was like some joke about like, you know, losing the corner light or something, but <laughs> that could be. that's all I can think of. I, I don't know for sure where uh, this came from. Um, the other one. And I don't know this one, this, this piece of information came with a little warning where they basically said like, I don't know how much detail he's going to get into on this one. Uh, apparently you had a very interesting experience with an Airbnb recently. Uh, I think it was this year or last year, really. Yeah. Yeah. Last season. Um, <laughs> it was at the Utah round and uh, we like to get Airbnb like the whole house. Right. Mm-hmm. So we get this Airbnb and it turns out that the downstairs is rented out. And uh, yeah, I don't even want to get into it too much, but basically <laughs> they were like yelling at us, like banging on the roof, like their ceiling was like our floor and they were like yelling at us in Spanish. And then my crew guys were yelling back down at them and then it just got really bad and really awkward. The The people downstairs like ended up going into their car and like they were like tuning up their stereo at like midnight <laughs> and like... First, like, just must have put in a bigger amp or some new subs or something, and then just were like bumping bass at like midnight. And then they went, my guys went out on the patio and were like, "Hey, like, you know, <laughs> shut up!" And then they're like yelling back at him in Spanish. I'm like, "Oh, this isn't this is not good. Like, what's going on here? Like, how did this happen?" So that's, I guess, something we got to be a little more conscious of when we book our Airbnbs and <laughs> yeah, make sure it's not a split. Yeah. Yeah. Gotta get the whole house, man. I mean, that's what like the the verbo thing is, right? Like you gotta right, right. Yeah. Have the whole house, yeah. not sharing it. So yeah, uh, first time that's ever happened to us, and yeah, we don't want that to happen again. <laughs> we we had uh, we rented one in Seattle. I think it was Seattle, and uh, the the listing had said like five bedrooms or something, and I was like with a crew of people, and uh, the guys get there ahead of time, like, dude, there's there's two bedrooms, 
Like there's, there's no way there's five bedrooms here. Right. So we're like freaking out and all this shit. And like, uh, this was like through a work thing. So like the person who booked it, I was like, yo, like what happened? And she's like, look at, look at the listing. It's got, it's got five bedrooms, says five bedrooms, all this stuff. And I'm like, okay, you have to contact the owner. So she contacts the owner and like calls me and she's like, you guys are the biggest bunch of idiots I've ever met. I'm like, why? And she's like, did you not read any of the instructions? I'm like, what do you mean? I guess in the instructions, it says, if you rent the basement, there is a separate entrance where there's three more bedrooms downstairs. Oh. So the, the first night everyone's there, there's two people in bedrooms and everybody else on the floor. <laughs> Meanwhile, there's two oh. full-size bedrooms like with like queen beds and like bathrooms. Like, <laughs> Oh, wow. Oh, man. It's like, there's such a trade-off between doing like the hotel and the Airbnb or like versus those two, right? Like right. hotels are expensive. Like, don't get me wrong, but there's like an expectation that it's like, it's going to be organized. It's probably going right. to be clean. All the amenities are going to be there. It's yeah. going to be clean. You're going to have everything you need. As for sometimes you get these Airbnbs and like, where's the towels or where's the toilet paper? Like what's going on? There's no hand soap. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I had one that was like, no shampoo and like I carry like yeah. a little bottle just in case, but like, yeah. I was like, this is a big place, man. We're like we got like eight people in here. Probably should only had like four, but like we got eight people in here. There's no <laughs> shampoo, but yeah, I would argue it's, it's, it definitely is better. Like, it's just nice to have like a kitchen and, and a spot that everybody can hang out. So you're not just like in the lobby or at a restaurant or something. Right. Like washer and dryer is big for us. Like, cause mm. if we're in the semi and we're on the road, like, live on the road for a while to where it's nice to like be able to have a washer and dryer. Yeah. Not have to go to laundromat to do your laundry. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's a solid, I mean, you can pull into like a loves. They've got like laundry services. And stuff, right. But, right. But that's, uh, yeah. that's kind of weird. <laughs> how do you, how do you eat healthy on the road? Like how do you stay like generally healthy traveling? My girl's really good with that. Like we'll pack the fridge, we'll pack the, you know, the cabinets full of, full of food, making sandwiches and you know, She's always reading the ingredients, always reading the labels, seeing what's in it, ah. which is good. I mean, she's taught me. She taught me, taught me well on that to where they put a lot of messed up stuff in our foods yeah. these days. And Are yeah, you- like fast foods, like non-existent. We don't eat fast food. Don't drink soda. Like try not to, you know, do any of that stuff. Mm. But. Hmm. Right, do, do, like, do you follow like any like particular diet or anything now or just like, just eat clean and good stuff? Yeah. Just try to eat clean whole foods. Yeah. Is there anything you crave? Like where you're like, man, I'd, I'd kill for some in and out. Like when I go to Hawaii, it's kind of like a pass. <laughs> like, <laughs> I knew it. I knew it. <laughs> it's, it's hard, you know, at some points you just like give in. You're like, okay. Like, you know, I, yeah, I got to get this. So yeah, I went, there's like a bur- there's a burger joint in Hawaii that like, I got to have like, and yeah, I love their French fries, which are like some of the only fries that I like I'll eat now. <laughs> Uh, well, I don't want to blow up their spot, so but that's that's good to know. I, I'm I'm definitely hitting you up. Like if I ever end up going to Hawaii, I'm like you're my yeah, first phone definitely. call, like, dude. I don't. I'm not one of those. Like I don't like the tourist experience anywhere I go. Like right. Some people like say like, oh yeah, Hawaii is not that good, or like I didn't have that good a time. But a lot of times people like go to Waikiki, stay in Honolulu. Yeah, and it's that's not Hawaii, you mm-hmm. know. Like it, you're in Hawaii, but that's like not what Hawaii is about. You right. Know? Like. You got to go to the country or I see Odie always goes to like Kauai. Like you got to go to one of those islands, like Kauai or Maui, like those, that's country. That's okay. Hawaii. Like, pres- like preserved, you know, just natural Hawaii. Mm-hmm. Like town, Waikiki, Honolulu, that's really not like the Hawaii vibe. Like the beaches there are just, eh, don't do it for you. But like you go out in the country and it's like, okay, these are, this is nice. You know? Yeah. For me, it's like, honestly, it's the coffee and like, I'm a huge coffee guy. And like, I, I mean, I understand the whole, I mean, from my perspective, somebody who's not native, but like understand the, the, a lot of the culture and stuff based around that. And it's like, I know of a lot of these like big roasters that are on the islands. And then it's like, I want to find one that like, you know, produces like a couple hundred pounds a year and that's it. Like, I don't, mm-hmm. if you've got big packaging and shit, I don't like, that's not me. I want to go somewhere where like, you're like hand stickering everything. And like your mom still works there. And like, you know, you just, you just sell whatever you can. And that's like, that's, that's what you do. Like, that's the kind of shit right. that gets me pumped. Yeah. So yeah. If you know any really good coffee spots, definitely. I, I'm, we're, we're working something out. I don't know when I'm going to Hawaii, but now it's stuck in my head. So. Right. Is there, is there like any drifting culture there or how, like how there does is. that work? There is. It's just, there's no track to where there's no outlet for 
them to do anything. They don't even have like parking lot events or anything to where back when I was living in Hawaii, I think like I left in like Oh six or Oh five. And when there was drift events, there'd be like 50 drivers at any given event, Mm. which for a small Island, like small population compared to like, you know, some of these States that like have events and don't pull more than 20 drivers, you know, like sometimes you go to these events and they're like dead. Like for a small location to pull 50 drivers at any given, you know, event, like yeah. it was always busy. There was always drivers. There's always people that wanted to drive. And I don't know, some politics behind like the track, like shutting down, like, you know, money, you know, just leases ending and whatever happened, the track closed and nobody's ever put one back together. Um, but they're sure there's still tons of enthusiasts there that would be ready to go to drift if there was you know, a chance for them to do it. Is it? You just need, some, you just need somebody to make another track. <sighs> yeah. Yeah. That's all right. Just, just which yeah, in Hawaii it's, it's money. Yeah. Obviously it's money. And they probably, what's crazy though, is like the, the track closed and they didn't use it for anything else. Like it just, they just put concrete in front of it and then just stayed, stayed there. Nobody did anything for it with it for years. Oh, <laughs> that, it's not like it, not like they put up a strip mall or like did something important with the property. It just sat there and grass was growing through it. It's one of those, like, I'm not going to, like, recommend people just, like, go break in somewhere to do something, but, like, nothing right. else is going on. Like, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I can't. There, I was some, like, un- there was some underground spots that were pretty good. Oh, I bet. That people kind of got into, you know. Well, but like, if it's, there- not the, it's not the same. Yeah. If there's no outlet, then, like, that's what happens, right? If you have nowhere mm-hmm. to do it legally, all you're going to do is force people to do it illegally. That That's, right. that's it. They're not going to change. So. Oh, there you go. There's your retirement, man. Like when you're like ready to wrap it up, just open a small, you know, garage and drift track in Hawaii and start it up again. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Yeah, I can see you doing that. Why not, right? I mean, I'm sure it's not cheap and, you know, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> sounds great in conversation, but. Right, right. Yeah. Is it is there like a particular style that comes out of there? Like, is it more Japanese influenced or like, is it? Yeah, yeah. definitely. Definitely Japanese influenced, like. Um, growing up in that, in that scene, like the Japanese influence was huge because I mean, we're closer to Japan than the States are like, they came to Hawaii three times before they ever even came to California. We had like, um, team orange, yeah. um, signal auto, I think came twice before they had even come to California for like the D one thing back in like Oh three or whatever. Hmm. So they had come to Hawaii like three times and brought cars and drivers and they blew everyone's mind. Like we'd never seen anything like it in person. You know, obviously we'd seen videos and like option magazines of their cars, but to see it in person was like, it's next level, you know? I did not know that. That's, that's really, I mean, I forget what years, like maybe Oh three, Oh two, like Oh one, even, I don't know exactly the years, but it was, it was a long time ago. Yeah. That would have been mind blowing. Like to, yeah, and they came with like proper cars. Like, <laughs> we're, like nobody had cars like that back then, you know? It's like stuff that we'd never seen before, V mounts and like top mount turbos and stuff. Like it was 450 horsepower was huge, you know? It was like, wow, this is like awesome. And then obviously the driving, the yeah. level of driving and, and Team Orange, they'd do like choreographed stuff too, you know? Like they would have it like set up to where they're like doing tandems and drifting around each other and just, yeah. Yeah. Next level stuff. So definitely super inspiring. Yeah. I, man, when 450 horsepower is a lot. Now we're so jaded. We're like, if it's not oh, a thousand horsepower, it's like, it's nothing. Oh, it's terrible. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, I mean, it's, it's just, just so hard to like maintain that. Yeah. Like <laughs> that thousand horsepower. It's like, it's great. It's a great show. It's awesome. It's super fun. It's super burly. But to maintain it, it's just so much more work, so much more money. And it puts its toll on everything. I mean, engines, transmissions, clutches, yeah. drive lines, like all the way down the line. It's just, it's abusive on everything. It's, it's not even the engine anymore that's the issue. Like we figured out how to make a thousand pretty reliable horsepower. Like we're not blowing engines like we used to, but it's, it's everything behind it. That's the problem. Like, you know, CVs and hubs. I like are at a point where like, yeah. The hubs are are exploding. Like, I, I saw that on Alec Robbins' car at Irwindale. Yeah. Like his hub failed. I'm like, I have never seen this happen. Like the splines literally like ovaled out on his hub. I was like, how is this possible? Never even heard of this. Like, yeah. 
Like that's, Crazy. that's where we're at. We're like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, I don't even know how you fix that at that point. Like, no, I just got to get a new one. <laughs> yeah. We're going to like develop hubs that have like deeper, thicker splines or something or right. like, right. yeah. Yeah. It's, it's wild. I mean, I, I think, yeah, I'm excited, but also like, I think we just like step it back a little. I really like the 275 or 285. Like, I think that's, you can still do really good drifts on. It. I mean, think like what, four years ago or five years ago, that was like the tire that people were running and everybody yeah. was like winning on to where like, it's still going to be really good if they, if they switch to that direction, it doesn't need to be 315s and 295s and stuff to put on a really good show. I, I would love to, I know, I think there's like one guy that's got a stack of them left. Maybe, maybe you have some too, but like, I would love to compare the Achilles from that time at that size to like what we're running now, even up to like a 295 to like, just see, cause I, I feel like I talk about the one, two, threes way too much, but like, that was such a game changing thing in drifting. Like oh, those tires were great. obscene. I do still have a stack. I d- figured. <laughs> But they're probably not the same as they were because they're like five years old. You know, you can't have a tire sit around for forever and expect it to be good. They dry out and stuff. Yeah. But. There's going to be like, like in the same way, there's like cheese caves and like whiskey caves. There's going to be tire caves where like guys are going to collect tires and like keep them in, you know, the proper humidity. Climate yeah. controlled. Yeah. Yeah. Like collectors, like, like, like sneaker heads, but for tires, right? Right. There's somebody out there who's got like some old hand kooks and they've got, you know, <laughs> <laughs> Maxis from back in the day, and then a bunch of Achilles one two threes. I think They're, the Vitors feel very similar to the Achilles one two threes. Yeah, like that's that's the the trade off. That's another tire that came in that it was like Jonathan Hurst got mad at me for talking about it too much because really? he's like, "Dude, you're gonna blow up the spot." I'm like, "These things are nuts, man!" Like I've watched. Yeah, he way- did. He did all that on a two fifty fives at Long Beach. Yeah. Like, that's pretty impressive. That's a front tire, and he was putting down, you know, like yeah. they're they're. I, I ran some of Dan Stuckey's uh, takeoffs, and I was thoroughly <laughs> impressed. I was like, "Wow, yeah, wow." <laughs> it's we're yeah, it's it's interesting that the the whole tire thing in in drifting is like it's such a it's such a unique thing. I I think I would love to do like just a standalone podcast, like informing people of the history of tires and FD, like. There's so much that like my, my knowledge base really like is strong within the last 10 years, but like mm-hmm. to try and see like how far we've come in the, the 10 years before that. Cause like it wasn't until Falcon really started diving in before we had like a drift specific tire. I drove on BFGs in 2010 in FD. Damn. For drift Emporium for that G35. Yeah. BFGs. I forget what they're called. The G force TAs or something. Okay. They were pretty terrible, but <laughs> <laughs> well, it was it was it was drifting. I mean, it's just weird. Like BFGs, they used to be an FD tire. Yeah, like, I think a BFG. I think off road. You know, like Baja. You know, King yeah. of the Hammer and stuff like that. It's like BFG. They were running drift cars. <laughs> yeah, look at. I mean, Max is same thing, right? Well, yeah, like, Sam Sam Hubinet, I think was always a BFG, and he did a lot of work on BFGs. I think you're right. Yeah. 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 I think I have to do this. I used to at like, the time, like he was just so much ahead of the game, like in skill level of driving. Yeah. Same with like Reese Millen. Like they came in from different backgrounds, but they were just like car build and like driving experience. They were just so ahead of like everything that they just came in and kind of whooped everyone. Yeah. I just, I think they had such an, a, a long experience of car control in general that like mm-hmm. they, they had such a deep knowledge base of, of other motorsports and how to, I mean, run teams and like, right. All knew that what stuff. Works. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. They knew how to run a program, knew how to like, you know, set up a whole operation. Yeah. Be prepared. Yeah. They just, they just came in and, and crushed. And then it was like, you know, everybody started to catch up and then, you know, Daigo came in and set everybody back again a little bit. And like, <laughs> like those are the eras. Like that's, that's, you can, you can break the history of, of FD and yeah. even drifting down into like these very specific eras. And it, yeah, I remember like the glory days, like a Falcon, like Falcon used to bring 10 drift cars to an event, three semis. Yeah. And they, they would make a U like a big U with yeah. their three semis and they'll just be lined up. I just thought that was the sickest, like going to an FD event back in like 2007 or eight or whatever with Ross Petty. And I was like, wow, this is like so cool. Mm-hmm. Just, all the cars that they had. And that was like, I mean, they spearheaded like 
drifting in America. Like they really pave pave the road for drifting. Yeah. Yeah. I I agree. And then like, you know, we kind of had like this this RTR era with like the two big rigs and like the double sided like that. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't we we haven't gotten back to that point, you know, really since 08 and like the financial crisis of of like that three rig falcon thing. But like, man, we get another good financial boom in the next couple of years. Like we're not far off from it again. Yeah. Do you do you think like obviously we like I said we don't know what the plan is for this year, but like can you see yourself if everything works out doing FD or just drifting for a long time or like like where you see yourself in the next 10? Uh I don't know. I don't even want to talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> it's too much, man. Uh, it's too much. I mean, I know, I know, I know myself where I see myself. I just don't want to talk about it. Yeah. Ah, that's fair. <laughs> no, I I mean, I think it's a lot to put it out there, right? Like once you kind of put it, yeah, put it yeah. out there, it's like people hold you to it too, right? Yeah. I mean, I love drifting. Like I'll always love drifting. It's like a part of my life. And, you know, I think I'll always want to swing a car around. I just don't know. Huh. Like I, I can't keep running my own program. Like I either got to drive for another team or just move on to something else. Cause like, I, I can't, I can't handle the burden of like running the whole operation, driving the semi, doing all this stuff. It's just, it's too much work for what it's you know worth really. Yeah. I, I still love driving. I still love putting on a show. I, like I said, that'll never go away, but the amount of work it takes to run it, it's, it's a lot. Yeah. I, I mean, I think you've created such a fan base and such a, like whether, whether you want to admit it or not, because I know, I mean, how kind of humble and quiet and stuff you are. Like, I think that's something most people don't know. It's just how quiet and I, I don't want to say shy, but like, you're kind of shy. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. No, I'll, I'll, I'll say that yeah. for sure. But I think you've created such a, a, a ethos around who you are for just being you that a team eventually will be in a situation where it's like, we need a driver and it's, it'll be you. Like there's no other choice. Like it, it only makes sense for it to be you. Yeah. Hopefully, hopefully we can get to that point. Cause I'd love to continue doing like FD and driving at this level. It's just, like I said, doing it, my own program. It's just, it's hard. It's too much. It's too much work. Yeah. I, I can't, I can't even fathom. Like I just, even like you said, booking Airbnbs, like figuring all that out, making sure that there's nobody in the basement, like, you know, making sure the rig's good to go that like when shit breaks, like that's, it's a lot. And then yeah. to then have to drive at the highest level in this sport and be perfect for a run, right? Because that's what it comes down to. If you're not perfect on that first run, it's over. Right, right. That's it's now or never. You just got to put it all out there and you know, it's got to work every time or yeah. back it up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I, dude, I, I get it, man. Like I get it. Like, don't get me wrong. I don't, I don't want you to go anywhere. I, th- I, I love watching you drive. Uh, I think you bring something to the sport that like nobody else is really bringing, which is phenomenal. Um, so yeah, I mean, and, and I, the whole fan base, I mean, like, it's the, everybody's very vocal about it. They want you here, but like, I also understand that like you're putting so much of your other part of your life on hold to do this one thing, right? Like you're sacrificing, yeah. especially with a yeah. kid now, like you're sacrificing mm-hmm. so much just to go and drive a car. Right. No. Yeah. I'll think of like years as like, think back on a year and I, I like remember it as like a livery on the car uh, and a season of FD. Like I think of like 2014. Oh, I remember that year because of the livery on the car and like what sponsors I had that year. You know, you, years start going by as like seasons of FD. Mm. And that's, it's tough to swallow. They were like, that's what you're going to remember out of that year. That's like your main, like, that's what makes you remember like that year. Yeah. And you, you'll see years of your life go into seasons of FD. Yeah. And yeah. That is, that is a lot. It's a lot to swallow when it comes down to like, yeah, raising a family and like trying to be there. And I don't know, I don't know how Odie does it. Like he's, you know, got two and looks like they're doing good, but yeah, I'm sure, you know. Yeah. I I mean, I don't, I don't want to speak to like his situation, but like, obviously, yeah, he's, he's figured it out. Like he's, yeah, he's got something sorted, but yeah, I dude, I, I get it, man. Like, I mean, now that I'm traveling as much as I am, it's tough. Like come home and my kids are like, 
super excited I'm home. And then I'm thinking to myself, I'm like, well, oh, you, what did you, you be f- back on the road? <laughs> yeah. And like, what did you feel like when I wasn't here? Right. Like oh, how yeah. sad were you? Or like, what did I miss? Like, dude, those are, those are th- 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 that shit you never get back. Right. Like, but then I'm also like, I, you know, it's, it's, it's so divided. Cause like I gave up my twenties to raise kids. So now I'm in my thirties and I'm like, finally have the ability to do the shit that I wanted to do in my twenties. So for me, like my plan is to bring my kids to as many events as I can. Like my, my daughter was in Florida last year. My son's been to like a bunch, he's been to so many grid lives. Um, or sorry, not just grid life. Like he was at grid life this past season, but like he's been to so many events. So it's mm-hmm. like, you know, that's how I can do it for now. So, but yeah. 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 And we brought, we brought our daughter along to a lot of the rounds last year. Yeah. She, she loves it. She loves it too much. <laughs> I'll be like trying to get in my car to go to qualify. And she's like screaming at me, like hanging on the door. Like I want to ride in the car. <laughs> <laughs> that's cool. <laughs> like it doesn't work like that. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah, I can't wait till she's old enough to like actually go for a ride along. That'll be so cool. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of like JTP, like that's, that's another one, right? Where like, you know, he stepped away and, and you just see it. Like the amount of time he's spending with his kid is crazy. And like that kid could be a ripper one day, man. What that kid can do with like an RC drift car is incredible. And then it's like, man, if you can do that with a real car, you're going to be a problem for a lot of people. JTP's kid is what actually like in my mind made me want to have a family. Wow. So we went camping off road trip, like up in Rubicon and we're all camping, like my whole group, his group, his wife and everyone. And like, there wasn't enough seats in all the buggies for some reason. And I guess he was maybe lap. He was riding on the lap or whatever. He was small. It was like three or four at the time. Mm -hmm. And, uh, my buggy had a back seat, like a little kid's back seat. And, uh, he ended up jumping in with me and riding with me up like the rest of the trail. And I was just like, this is awesome. Like he had always told me, like when he first had Jax, he's like, you got to do this. You got to have a kid. This is like the best thing. I'm like, yeah, I was 2014. I was like, no way you're tripping. Like, I, I don't want to have a kid. Yeah. And then, yeah, like what, four years later, I was, wow, this is amazing. You know, like just cruising with a little boy like that. I was like, I can really see myself doing that. And that's like when I realized like, yeah, like we ain't getting any younger. Like at this point, like, do I want to be like super old and have a kid or do I want to have a kid now where I can have fun and keep up with this kid as I'm, as I'm growing, you know, yeah. to where it's funny that, yeah, his, his boy is the reason that I actually like got, you know, cause there's a point where you're like, okay, I'm, I'm ready. Like I, I want to do this and not for everyone. Sometimes it just happens. Yeah, but for yeah. me, I was like yeah. ready. Like I was like, in my mind, I was like, I want to have a kid. Like this is something that I want to do. And it was because of JTP's son. Ah, that's cool. I had no idea. That's such a, dude, yeah. that's such a wholesome story, man. Yeah. It's, yeah. I don't know. I, I, I know it's like, isn't a, a parenting podcast, but it's, yeah, it's, it's wild. I mean, I got to my it's part of life. Yeah. My, my son and I got to play hockey together. Like, like actually like have a, a game where I was playing and he was playing and it was like, oh, nice. dude, it was just such like a crazy time or like, I, they're like yeah, halfway like through the thinking game. about it. Like you probably like think, man, like, how are you so big? Cause Dude. you know, those years fly by like, yeah, it was probably a toddler not that long ago. And now he's like playing a game of hockey with you. You're like, yeah. where, where'd the time go? Yeah, dude, <laughs> it's, it's, it's like, it was yesterday. Like I'm, I remember, I remember all of it and it's like, it's been a decade and like, yeah. So anyways, it's, yeah. I think you and I could do the parenting thing like forever. I mean, there's so <laughs> many, so many cool conversations about that, but I'm, I mean, like I said, I'm I, so a little off topic for what we're supposed I, to be talking about. You know what about though? I mean, like I said, I mean, before we started this show, for for anybody listening, like I don't, I don't give you guys a lot of info before we kick this off. And <laughs> what I what I said to you before this is like my job is to get people to know you different or better, and like that's it. That's all I want to do, man. Like people know you for the driving, you know. People know you for your history in FD and what you've done with the sport, and you know, a couple people listening are going to know you personally. But like at the end of the day, I want everybody to understand that like you guys are human beings with real lives and real emotions and real shit going on. So like, you know, when you're just watching you guys on the screen, that there's like a different connection, right? Yeah. That's, that's it. Like you've, you guys are owed that you guys, as we said, like you guys give up so much of your life to compete in this sport and entertain everybody listening that like at the very bare minimum, what I can do is provide you 
at least some time to talk about something that just isn't what everybody sees on screen. That's that's how I see it. Yeah. So yeah. No, it's good to like kind of like give some people some insight because I've had people like mad at me for not running seasons of FD, like literally yeah. writing me mad that I'm not running, and I'm just like. Bro, like I got like stuff going on. I have a life. I have a family. I've, I'm moving. I'm like, I'm doing this or I'm doing that. Like I, it, like I don't just live formula drift. Like there, I yeah. have to, you know, handle priorities and like handle like life too at the same time. So yeah, there's, I guess, yeah, it is good to shed some light on the situation, let people kind of know like, Hey, this is, we are real, real people. We do have these same, you know, things going on that everyone else does. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, the more I chat with like all you guys, like I mean, any anybody, it's like everyone's just a person. Everyone's got their own shit going on. Like no matter how famous you feel, like that person is. Like I know I, I don't want to speak for you, but like you probably don't feel famous. Like no, yeah, no, I don't walk around like I'm forced high, like yeah, I'm famous. I'm, you don't know me? What? Yeah, no, like I just I just cruise and when people do come up to you and like hey, can I take a pic? I'm like oh yeah, of course, yeah. yeah let's, Get a picture. And then sometimes I'm with friends and I'm like, what? what was that all about? I'm like, oh, well, yeah, like, well, I, I <laughs> drift cars and like this guy's a fan, you know, and they like don't understand really what's going on because I'm just, just forced, like normal person. Yeah. Like people that aren't into cars that I'm friends with, you know, that like, yeah. Just, yeah. I'm just, just, all, I'm just a guy. We're all here living. Yeah, yeah. We're just all here trying to do our best. Yeah. Wow. Trying to enjoy life because life is short. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. When you're a kid, you're like, man, this time takes forever. I'm tired of being a kid. And then when you get older, you're like, wow, where did the time go? I heard a, a good explanation of it. And it's like, when you're, when you're 10, every year is one-tenth of your life. But then when you're 30, every year is a 30th of your life. So that's why it seems right. like it's going faster. It's like every year is less, mm -hmm. less of the total amount of life that you've lived. So it goes yeah. really quick. That does make sense. Yeah. That one's kind of stuck with me. I'm like, yeah, I, I get that now. Cause like, dude, yeah. summer's last used to last forever. Right. You're yeah. like grade seven. Yeah. Like, dude, summer was forever. And then now it's like, where did it go? Like what? I feel like FD just ended. I'm like, wait, it's fe February already. Like, yeah. What am I doing? We're like, like can, I, can I even get this together in a couple of months? Like, Oh yeah. We're shoot. like 10 weeks out, dude. I, I'm not to scare you, but like, we're like 10 <laughs> weeks out. <laughs> Oh yeah. See, it doesn't look good for me. Nah, dude, crazy shit happens. Don't worry about it. Some, I hope, dude, I hope something just like comes along where you can be like, yeah, I'm just going to be a driver of this car. Hopefully. I mean, it won't be this year, but maybe, uh, maybe soon we'll see. Yeah. Sick. Well, uh, I mean, we've, we've already done a bunch. We're close to two hours. I, I, I thank you. Thank you for doing this. I know it's of been course, like a, to try and get both of our schedules to align has been a, has been a fun time, but, um, I'm glad we finally got to, to do it. I mean, uh, I, yes. yeah, definitely one of my, before any of this, one of my favorite drivers before I ever didn't you work for FD. So for me, it's, it's definitely a, it's definitely a little bit of a pinch me moment, but I'm, I'm happy that we got to just shoot the shit and hang out. We did a little bit in Laguna as well, but yeah. 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 No, it's cool, man. Um, well, awesome. Yeah. Anything you want to throw to seeing there? you this year? Yeah. No, I, I'll see you around, man. I'll, I'll be, yeah. Just look for the hat. It's all you got to do. I guess. <laughs> Stupid. Trademark. <laughs> ah, something, man. Something. Um, anything you want to throw out there? Last minute shout out or anything before we close up? No, I'm good. Th thank you. Thank you to everyone. Thank you to all the fans. Thank you to FD. Thank you to my partner. Thank you to my parents. I mean, everyone. Yeah. yeah. Sick. Well, for everybody listening and watching at home, thank you guys for for listening and watching. Um, make sure to follow all four stuff and like. Yeah, just just go follow his stuff. Maybe just you just got updated a bit more, dude. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's all good. Um, yeah, we'll uh, we'll chat soon.